nice to see you. It's a pleasure. Good to see you again. How are you? Thank you I'm the vice president of water utility. Oh. getting all the
Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us uh, today for this important hearing. Ranking Member Capito and I thank uh, all of our witnesses for joining us today as well, including our witnesses and colleagues from uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania. We look forward to the testimony of each uh, one of you. As we know, last month news broke about an environmental disaster caused by a Norfolk Southern train derailment near East Palestine, Ohio, less than a mile from the Pennsylvania border. We are here today to discuss that train derailment and subsequent hazardous chemical release, which led to a controlled burn of dangerous chemicals and the mandatory evacuation of some 2,000 people. This tragic incident is a reminder of the importance of following the golden rule and treating other people the way we would like to be treated if we were in their shoes. Today's hearing is an opportunity to put ourselves in the shoes of those impacted by this disaster, examine the immediate response, and ensure long-term accountability for the cleanup efforts. It's our responsibility in Congress to answer, one, what went wrong, two, what do we need to do to fix it, what do we need to do to make sure it never happens again. Every so often, environmental disaster in our country underscores our responsibility to protect public health and our environment. In 1969, I recall seeing news uh, coverage of a train spark that ignited the polluted Cuyahoga River near Cleveland, Ohio, just north of Ohio State, Ohio State where I was a Navy Watson midshipman a year earlier. As our nation watched a, a, gall, a river engulfed in flames, it served as a wake-up call to better protect communities from hazardous substances and to take responsibility for cleaning up environmental disasters. This movement helped lead to the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, which has a broad bipartisan support, had broad, broad, broad bipartisan support. My hope is that uh, in the aftermath of the disaster in East Palestine, we can come together once again to identify solutions that will protect communities, improve safety, and restore trust. We must work together with our colleagues on other relevant House and Senate committees to strengthen our nation's rail safety regulations, ensure compliance with them, and prevent future incidents like this one from happening again. We also need to make sure that the impacted communities receive the resources and the support that they need. Our existing laws have allowed EPA to identify Norfolk Southern as a responsible party and began to hold the corporation responsible for the cost of the emergency response, as well as for the long-term remediation of this area. We want to hear from our witnesses today whether Norfolk Southern is meeting its obligations, including its moral obligations. In addition, we should note that uh, responding to this disaster is a shared responsibility between de different levels of government and Norfolk Southern. And it is imperative for us to ensure that the agencies tasked with responding to disasters like this have the necessary resources that they need to ensure the safety of the air that people breathe, the water they drink, and the soil they use on which to grow crops. It's worth noting that the Biden administration has been on the ground from day one. As we'll hear today, the EPA working alongside state and local partners arrived in East Palestine within hours after the derailment and has maintained a presence ever since. In fact, Administrator Regan has visited the area, I'm told, some three times already and expects to go back for more. In the wake of the chemical releases, these government entities have worked tirelessly to install air and groundwater monitoring systems, as well as sample the water in the air for toxics and oversee the re uh, removal of contaminated soil. Norfolk Southern appears to have cooperated with these orders and has agreed to pay for the environmental cleanup resulting from the derailment. However, the ultimate cost costs may exceed the immediate cleanup needs. And moreover, an, an apparent uh, lack of transparency on the part of Norfolk Southern, at least in the early days of the response, has left some members of the community battling with mistrust and looking for answers. We're told that the company's failure to communicate directly includes information given to some first responders who were under the impression that only one car would be vented and burned rather than five. And this miscommunication left first responders scrambling to ensure the public safety requirements of a much, much larger plume. We've also heard from some residents who were told it was safe to return to their homes, but are still experiencing ongoing health problems. Other concerns remain, such as loss of property values and the long-term impacts on the most uh, vulnerable citizens, including children 
and the elderly. As I said earlier, today presents us with the opportunity to learn from this experience, address misinformation, and gain a better understanding of the long-term plan to protect public health and address the environmental impacts of this disaster. Just as we witnessed an earlier environmental disaster in Ohio 54 years ago that I've alluded to, a new generation of Americans is now waiting to see how their government responds today and in the days to come. This incident may well prove to be a defining moment in their lives as it was in my own. Let's do what's right, not only for the people of East Palestine, but for everyone who believes that those who transport potentially dangerous chemicals must take the necessary steps to protect our people and our one and only planet. And with that, let me turn over the rest of uh, the opening statements here to my ranking member and my partner in so many ways, Senator Capito. Senator Capito. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you for being here today. And uh, I'm really pleased that we have the hearing and we have our fellow senators here with us as well. We're, as you said, we're going to discuss the ongoing environmental response to a large-scale chemical spill resulting from a Norfolk Southern train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, which is 14 miles north of the West Virginia border. Before we go any further, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the emergency responders who were on the scene uh, and less than an hour after the incident was reported and are continuing today to work diligently on our cleanup efforts. Thank you all so much. These kinds of accidents are some of the toughest days for them because these men and women, these are their neighbors. These, in some cases, their relatives and certainly their hometown friends. So it weighs on all of us here. This catastrophe upended the lives of thousands of our constituents and states represented today. The residents of East Palestine and other impact communities, including those in West Virginia, deserve the chance to hear publicly from those uh, involved in and affected by the cleanup efforts. They need to know what progress has been made, the challenges that lay ahead, and what lessons can be learned to improve future responses. From day one, responders across all levels of government, as well as the private sector, have worked around the clock on monitoring and mitigation to keep the public and environment safe. I appreciate EPA and other rele relevant organizations for providing regular updates to Congress on the status of the response. However, I want to convey to all of you that the public deserved a better level of transparency and much, much sooner. A month after the accident, it's clear to me that EPA's risk communication strategy fell short. In the immediate aftermath of the incident, impacting, co impacted communities were clamoring for answers. While we're well aware that monitoring efforts and response planning need to be sound, we need to understand why it took so long for the EPA to get accurate data to the public. This is especially true when organizations like the Ohio EPA and the Ohio, Ohio River Valley Sanitation Commission, better known as Orsenco, both represented on our panel today, managed to provide data and safety information to the public quicker. That even includes they were distributing EPA data faster than the agency itself was willing to, not only with the public, but also during briefings and conversations with the affected congressional offices. In the absence of adequate transparency to the public, social media, that just opens up a gap for social media, armchair citizen scientists, and political pundits on both sides to fuel false narratives that have further undermined that public confidence in the response to the derailment. With each week passing, the, the confusion seemed to grow. Even after weeks of repeated air, soil, and water monitoring have shown levels of the implicated contaminants of magnitude well below the a ATSDR and EPA levels of concern in the air and water, the initial delays in messaging and response has meant that the residents still do not trust these results enough to feel safe. And trust is essential in these situations. That has been made worse, I think, by a lot of the misinformation that we've seen. You can't address fear and mistrust by, print, by pointing residents to an EPA website filled with fact sheets and press releases. Risk communications needs to be done in a clear but compassionate, relatable manner right down there where it's happening. So why did it take weeks for the EPA administrator to drink the water he repeatedly told residents was safe? Why did it take almost a month to establish a response center and go door to door to East Palestine families' concerns? As a result of early missteps, I believe um, that we need to keep moving forward here. 
This committee must get to the bottom of whether EPA has some of the authorities for some of the actions that it's taken on the removal and whether they are serving the best interests of our constituents. So how will EPA approving every shovel full of dirt that is moved benefit safety or expedite the process? These are the questions I'm going to have. How and why is EPA prohibiting contaminated soil and water from leaving the state of Ohio for quali into, into qualified destruction facilities, how's that going to improve outcomes? I'm concerned that at least one of the Ohio facilities EPA is now activating for this purpose has a history of Clean Air Act, uh, Act violations and may not be able to sufficiently destroy contaminated soils in a way that assures communities may not be further impacted by emissions resulting from incomplete incineration. So. Uh, the EPA has been slow to respond to some of our office's inquiries on the use of PFAS firefighting foams in combating the fire, nor explaining how residues from those foams may be responsible for some of the purported pollution that has uh, made the rounds. The EPA could have also made abundantly clear that Norfolk Southern would be completely liable and that no expense would be spared in the cleanup efforts that's required by the law. Instead, it took weeks for the average American not well versed in the nuances of CERCLA, which is the, the act that covers this, to receive that assurance. Mr. Shaw from Norfolk Southern will be on our panel, and I look forward to hearing from you on what Norfolk Southern is doing to make things right. But as you know, and as you've stated in your statement, your company will pay for the harm that it has caused and is paying. It will pay for the initial cleanup and likely pay again when the lawsuits from the myriad harms caused begin to come in, though how much will be a matter for the courts. Culpability in this incident and the liabilities that will result are clearly defined in the statutes known as CERCLA, and the liabilities for Norfolk Southern under CERCLA are among the broadest and strictest in any federal law. Before Congress considers any changes to existing laws, we must better understand what has gone wrong with this response so far and what can be done better in the future but also what went right. So to the residents of East Palestine and surrounding communities, your Congress hears you. Every American deserves to feel safe in their home and confident that the water that they drink and that the air that they breathe is safe. When something like this happens, God forbid, they should also be able to trust the federal government will be quick, deliberate, transparent, and clear in their response, and that guilty par parties will be held responsible. I believe the environmental laws on the book are up to the task. So what has gone wrong? What has gone right? That's what we're here to talk about today. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. And let me now recognize Senator Jeff Merkley. Jeff is the chairman of the Subcommittee on Chemical Safety, Waste Management, Environmental Justice, and Regulatory Oversight. And we'll recognize him for his statement. Jeff, you recognize uh, Thank you very much, Chairman Carper and Ranking Member Capito for today's hearing. As chair of the Chemical Safety Subcommittee, it's absolutely critical we examine the impacts to public health and well-being of the people of East Palestine following this disastrous derailment of a Norfolk Southern freight train that was carrying tons of toxic and hazardous materials and, and the, certainly the impact coming from the plumes of smoke that burned for over two days. This tragedy demands accountability because future derailments will happen unless we learn the lessons of this incident, there will undoubtedly be more derailments, derailments with devastating impacts on additional communities. For years, my office has been hearing from Oregonians who are terrified about the risks of trains rolling down the tracks in the middle of their towns full of toxic chemicals. They remember when a Union Pacific train derailed in Mosier, Oregon in June 2016, spilling some 42,000 gallons of crude oil in front of a school, a massive fire, damage to the water and sewer systems, and the, the uh, debris made their way into the Columbia River. And they remember the billowing tower of toxic black smoke that could be seen for miles and miles up and down the Columbia Gorge in an area blanketed in toxic ash. At that time, Senator Wyden and I pushed for huge improvements in track maintenance, improvements in the brakes, improvements in the tank cars, improvements in the pre-positioning of supplies to respond to disasters, and improvements in communications. But the progress was very limited. Since 2015, there have been 100 derailments of trains carrying hazardous materials, one per month. In this coming year, there'll probably be another 12 at this pace. 
As of 2017, around a million tons of hazardous materials is transported by rail every day. And that was the last year the numbers were released, and I suspect they're even higher today because we have growing supplies of toxic chemicals, particularly related to the plastics industry. We know the danger posed by these chemicals. We know that when they're going down the rails, there's the possibility of a disaster, but there's so much that can be done to limit the odds of disasters happening, and that's our responsibility. We need to recognize that when a derailment occurs and toxic chemicals like vinyl chloride are leaked, people are aware that these chemicals cause lymphoma and leukemia and cancers. And so they're absolutely, legitimately, extremely concerned, and many residents of East Palestine are complaining about all sorts of, of, of health issues. So let's have this hearing today to be an opportunity for us to examine not just the response, but how to prevent these derailments in the future, the type of investments that are required so that future communities are not terrorized by these derailments that are happening at a pace of once per month. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Capito for the opportunity to share those comments. Senator uh, Markley, thank you so much. Uh, now I'm going to recognize Senator Mullen, the subcommittee ranking member for his statement. Senator Mullen, you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to start off by thanking everyone, including our five panelists, um, and Senator Brown, uh, Senator Vance, and Senator Casey, uh, for attending this hearing. The people of East Palestine have shown per perseverance and bravery during the time that are, that's understandably they're very anxious and upset about. In the aftermath of the derailment, the decision was made to burn hazardous chemicals, uh, leaking from rail cars out of fear of explosion. Since then, residents have reported headaches, coughing, fatigue, irritation, pain, burning sensations on their skin. People of East Palestine now fear their health, despite the EPA claiming that everything's okay. The public's trust in the government is near record load. Only 20% say that they trust the government to do the right thing. After the last three years, there's no wonder that, that, that the residents are calling into question about the response and the advice the government bureaucrats is giving. The mixed messaging from the administration in the days and weeks after the tragedy has only added the fuel to the fire. Actions have consequences. Both the Secretary, and Transporta uh, Secretary of Transportation and the Administrator of the EPA delayed their visit to East Palestine says, and says that when they got there, hey, it wasn't our problem. It was the previous administration and their deregulation that caused this. It's time for everyone to take responsibility. In contrast, I applaud the timely on-ground response efforts from the local uh, residents and the first responders. The people of Ohio have truly come together to help neighbors in the time of need. In Oklahoma, we call that the Oklahoma standard. Moving forward, today's hearing allows us and allows witnesses to provide much needed clarity and assurance to the public. We need to know how to prevent tragedies like this from happening again. We need to know what caused it. There are serious questions that need to be addressed, such as the states that toxic waste is being shipped to, how long the chemicals were setting in the cars, if the bearings were appropriately reinspected, why were all five cars burned instead of just the one, why the administration and Norfolk failed to provide accurate and timely information to local authorities, and finally, what are we going to do about the town moving forward? The residents understandably do not feel safe, and we need a plan to put their lives back together. I expect our witnesses, witnesses to transparently discuss these issues so we can prevent accidents like this from occurring in the future. Leaders take responsibilities. They don't point fingers and dodge responsibilities. The people of East Palestine need to see the administration and Norfolk take responsibility and show result, results. I yield back. Thanks, Todd. Thanks very much for that, uh, for that comment. Before uh, we, uh, we turn to our uh, colleagues who joined us uh, for today, I, I want to just take, uh, ask unanimous consent if I could to submit for the record a statement on behalf of our EPW colleague, Senator John Fetterman of Pennsylvania, who cannot be with us uh, here today. For my colleagues, I'd just like to quote a couple of lines from Mr. Fetterman, Senator Fetterman's uh, testimony, and here's what he says. He said, I'm working with my colleagues across both state and party lines to fight for the forgotten people of Pennsylvania and Ohio, hold Norfolk Southern responsible for the damage that they've caused, and prevent similar disasters from happening in the future. 
I'd spe specifically like to thank uh, my colleagues from Ohio, Senator Sherrod Brown and Senator J.D. Vance for being great partners with uh, Senator Bob Casey and myself throughout this uh, process. Senator Fetterman, Lady Slave states in his testimony, and I quote, my hope is that we answer this disaster caused by egregious negligence from Norfolk Southern with real policy solutions that will hold Norfolk Southern and other similar companies accountable while making American families safer in the future. I believe that the legislation introduced last week is a great state, a great step. And I look forward to getting some answers today and continue to work with, uh, with my colleagues to get Pennsylvanians and Ohio's alike the resources that they need. And uh, that's his, his statement. We thank him for it. We now turn to our colleagues who joined us here today. First, I want to recognize Senator Bob Casey. Uh, Senator Casey from Pennsylvania, you're welcome to proceed when you are ready. Please proceed. Thank you, Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and members of the committee for holding today's hearing. I'm grateful to provide some testimony. I'm also grateful that I'm running ahead of both of my colleagues, Senator Brown and Senator Vance, because of my chairmanship of the Aging Committee, which is starting, uh, we're starting a hearing rather soon, so I appreciate their indulgence. I do want to thank both Senator Brown, Senator Vance, and Senator Fetterman for working with us and others on this bill. Representative Deluzio of Pennsylvania as well has worked on this in the House, I know, with others. And I wanted to start fr from the Pennsylvania side of this, Darlington Township, Pennsylvania, Beaver County, right on the Ohio border. As many of you know, the derailment occurred just literally feet away from the Pennsylvania border. And I know you'll hear today from Eric Brewer, who is the Director of Emergency Services and Chief of Hazardous Materials uh, Response from Beaver County, and I'm grateful for his testimony. I'll just quote maybe three people. That'll, that's all I'll do in the interest of brevity. The first is Police Officer Dan Frederick about his experiences on the ground that night, and I'm quoting him. Uh, as a first responder, particularly as a police officer, we, un we all know and understand the risks that come with our line of work. However, we usually know or have an idea of when something or someone can kill us. When I left my two boys and wife to respond to the, quote, hot zone, I was expecting to be informed of exactly what was on the train and the potential health hazards. To say I was scared the night of the derailment is an understatement, unquote. I've also heard from residents about their fear of long-term health impacts and the safety of their families and communities moving forward. Jenny Santana of Darlington Township said, and I quote, I want to know it's safe to stay here. All the people deserve honest answers and nobody's getting them. If, 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 it, were, if it were your children and their ch your children's lives in question, how far away would be safe? Please hold them accountable and, and, and uh, make them help us, unquote. Farmers in the region, I've heard, and I know my colleagues have heard the same, are, are concerned as well. They want help from the Department of Agriculture. They want certainty that their crops and their livestock are safe and free from contamination and that the food supply and their livelihoods are safe. Farmer in uh, Darlington Township Chair, Mike Carrion, said, quote, we, we, along with countless other local agricultural producers, have years invested in telling our stories and developing relationships with our customers. The stories of working in harmony with nature to produce a superior product. This story was ripped to pieces on the day of the derailment. It's now our responsibility to do damage control for Norfolk Southern's negligence while absorbing revenue loss of canceled orders. The economics of our industry is very emotionally driven. Emotions are now being driven by perception and lack of information. We need testing. We need uh, factual information. We needed this yesterday, and we're still not re seeing that response, unquote. So these residents are scared, particularly the potential exposure that could lead to health impacts for themselves and their families for years. And we do have a response, at least for the future, we have a lot of work to do in the near term, but the, the future has to be about passing the R Railway Safety Act that Senator Brown, Senator Vance, Senator Fetterman, and I and others are leading. It's bipartisan. That never happens around here on big bills, or rarely, I should say. It would be a good start by Norfolk Southern to tell us today, in addition to what more they're going to do for the people of Ohio and Pennsylvania, tell us today that they support the bill. That would help. If, if a major rail company said, 
We support these reforms and will help you pass this bill. So that's what I think the people of both states deserve. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for this time and I'm, I'm grateful to be first in line. Thanks very much. Thank you uh, very, very much, uh, uh, Senator Casey. Uh, next, we're gonna hear from uh, Senator Jared Brown from, uh, from Ohio. Mr. Chair, Jared Brown. Mr. Chair, thank you, and Ranking Member Capito, thank you, and uh, Senator Merkley and Senator Mullen, thank you all four for your th thoughtful uh, reflections and comments. I wanna recognize Ohioans this morning, Ann Vogel with the Ohio EPA, who has been on site many times, including I believe every time I've been there, in the residents of East Palestine who made the trip. Uh, mothers who talked about what this means to their family. They represent Ohioans in this tight-knit town in Columbiana County, which once made 80% of the ceramics in this country, tableware, they, were, they produced 80% for the whole country in this, in this uh, community. Uh, they've seen their jobs move overseas where companies pay workers less. That's been the story of far too many places in our states. It's the kind of community that's so often forgotten or exploited by corporate America. Now these Ohioans are worried about whether their water is safe to drink, the air is safe to breathe, whether their kids will get sick, whether their crops are contaminated, whether they'll still be able to do business and attract investment to the community. Like Senator Vance, in my visits to East Palestine, I've talked with residents, Mayor Conway, Fire Chief Drabick, business owners, parents. I've heard their fears for what this means for their town and fears for the future all because a big corporation, Norfolk Southern, chose to invest much of its math, massive profits in making its executives and shareholders wealthy at the expense of Ohio communities along its rail tracks. East Palestine, Steubenville, Sandusky, and just a week ago, Springfield. The company followed the Wall Street business model. Boost profits by cutting costs at all costs. The consequences for places like East Palestine be damned. In 10 years, Norfolk Southern eliminated 38% of its workforce. Think of that, in a decade, they cut more than a third of their jobs. We've seen what the company did with their massive profits. Norfolk Southern spent $3.4 billion on stock buybacks last year, and we're planning to do even more this year. That's money that could have gone to hiring inspectors, up to putting more hot box detectors along its rail lines, to having more workers available to repair cars and repair, repair tracks. Repair tracks. Norfolk Southern's profits have gone up and up and up, and look what happened. The NTSB is conducting a special investigation in Norfolk Southern and its culture, investigating five significant accidents since December of 2021, including three accidents that resulted in the death of a Norfolk Southern employee. If Norfolk Southern had paid a little more attention to safety and a little less attention to its profits, it cared a little more about the Ohioans along its tracks and a little less about its executives and shareholders, these accidents would not have been as bad or maybe not happened at all. Just this week in Cleveland, a Norfolk Southern conductor and BLT union member was killed in the job. Lewis Schuster was the proud father of a 16-year-old son. It's Norfolk Southern's responsibility to keep its workers safe on the job, but this company has failed to do its job over and over and over. When I talk with Ohioans about what they want to see from this company in response to the disaster in East Palestine, I hear two things. First, Norfolk Southern must pay the money for every cent of the cleanup, as you've all said. Every water test, every hotel room, every bottle of water, every hospital bill. If an Ohioan comes down sick, becomes, be, 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 Ohioan is sick because of the contaminants next week, next year, for the next several years. We know this company can afford it. My colleague Senator Vance and I and our Ohio delegation members of both parties have come together to make these demands of Norfolk Southern. Today, Ohioans expect to, have, to hear a firm commitment from this company's CEO that it will pay whatever it costs for as long as it takes to make this community whole. Second, Ohioans want assurances, as I think you all do, that this will not happen again. They have every right to be scared. On Saturday evening, just a month after the company's disaster in East Palestine, another Norfolk Southern train derailed in Springfield, Ohio. This time, the cars that derailed weren't carrying hazardous chemicals, but other cars on that 200-plus car train were. The only thing that saved Ohioans from another disaster was luck, but we need more than that. 
That's why Senator Vance and I have come together to introduce our Bipartisan Railway Safety Act to make trains safer as they go through community after community. It shouldn't take a train derailment for elected officials to put partisanship aside and work together for the people whom we serve, not corporations like Norfolk Southern. Lobbyists for the rail companies have spent years fighting every effort to strengthen rules to make our trains and our rail lines safer. Now Ohioans are paying the price. If this company is serious in its commitment to preventing more East Palestines in Ohio and across the country, I hope today that Mr. Shaw, as Senator Casey said so emphatically, I hope today Mr. Shaw will endorse our common sense bipartisan plan. Senator Vance and I come from different parties, different philosophies, but on this we've come together for the people of our state, and I appreciate his work on this. The response to this crisis has been far too partisan, as Mrs. Senator Mullen said. Today is an opportunity to change that. Senator Vance and I are listening to the same Ohioans in this community. We both made numerous trips there, people who feel like they have no way to stand up to a company like Norfolk Southern and are worried about what will happen when the cameras pack up and leave that Columbia a county community. These communities have been abandoned too many times before. My job, our job, is to hear their voice and to demand corporate accountability to bring this town back to the vibrant community we know that it can be again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Brown. And lastly, we want to recognize Senator Jay D. Vance. Senator Vance, you may uh, begin. Thank Great, you. thank you. So I want to start by acknowledging the people of, of East Palestine and Anne at the Ohio EPA has done a great job on this tragedy and just say that I think that our leadership, our media and our politicians were slow to respond to this crisis in part because a certain segment of our leadership feels like the people of East Palestine are a little out of style. They have the wrong politics, they're a little too rural, maybe a little too white. And I want to thank Senator Capito and, 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 and Senator Carper, the chairman and ranking member, and all of you for paying attention to this, for caring about this issue, and for showing leadership on it. I think the most important message to the people of East Palestine is that we will not forget about them in the months and years to come. And I think this committee hearing reinforces that message. So it's very personally meaningful for, for me to be here. Um, I, I want to I also talk about something that, that hasn't gotten enough attention, but I think is an important part of what's going on on the ground right now in East Palestine, which is the cleanup of the toxic chemicals that are in the ground, and they're still in the ground. Now, two weeks ago, I would have told you, and I said very publicly, that I was frustrated with Norfolk Southern from Alan Shaw on down for the refusal to dig up the railroad tracks and dig out the toxic chemicals, which is their responsibility to do. I am happy to report that it appears that Norfolk Southern has finally started to do the cleanup in earnest, but now the EPA is making it harder to get the materials out of Ohio in the first place into properly licensed facilities. Right now, as we speak, there are piles of dirt accumulating in East Palestine, piles of dirt filled with toxic chemicals that haven't been moved out of the state in a week. What happens if it rains? What happens if the very toxic dirt that we just dug out of the ground begins to seep back into the ground, causing problems for the air and water for the residents of East Palestine. We need leadership. We need the EPA to get on the ground and aggressively get this stuff out of East Palestine into properly licensed facilities. It's maybe the most important and most pressing thing that's confronting the community of East Palestine today. And again, I thank Ann for her leadership on that particular issue. After the cleanup, we're focused on the cleanup now, justifiably so, but after the cleanup, we need to turn to how to prevent this from happening or at least how to make it less likely. I'm a realist. I recognize that you're always going to have accidents, but I think that we can make them less likely, and I think, importantly, we can give our first responders proper notice when they're responding to these derailments when they happen. It is ridiculous that firefighters and local officials don't know that hazardous chemicals are, on their, are, are in their community, coming through their community, and in East Palestine, you had a community of largely volunteer firefighters responding to a terrible crisis, toxic burning chemicals without knowing what was on them. It's one of the things that the legislation that Senator Brown, Senator Casey, and Senator Federman and I have worked on together, and I thank them for their, their, their work on, on that issue. I want to talk just, I, I want to leave, leave the committee with just a couple of, of additional thoughts here. Um, I'm a Republican. I'm a pretty conservative Republican, um, and I worry that there has been a movement in my party and in my movement in response to the legislation that I proposed that would not hold Norfolk Southern or the rail industry accountable. I want to be explicit about that. 
Now, I'm not talking about returning, and this bill is not returning to the days of rate setting. The 1980s level air, or airline and trail, rail deregulation, I think in a lot of ways was good for consumers and good for the industry, but that doesn't mean we cannot have reasonable public safety enhancements in response to what happened in East Palestine. Now, I've talked to a number of my Republican colleagues, and nearly everybody has dealt in complete good faith, whether they like the bill or have some concerns about it, and these comments are not directed at them. Who they are directed at is a particular slice of people who seem to think that any public safety enhancements for the rail industry is somehow a violation of the free market. Well, if you look at this industry and what's happened in the last 30 years, that argument is a farce. This is an industry that enjoys special subsidies that almost no industry enjoys. This is a, an industry that is, enjoys special legal carve-outs that almost no industry enjoys. This is an industry that just three months ago had the federal government come in and save them from a labor dispute. It was effectively a bailout, and now they're claiming before the Senate and the House that our reasonable regulation, our reasonable legislation is somehow a violation of the free market. Well, pot, meet the kettle, because that doesn't make an ounce of sense. You cannot claim special government privileges. You cannot ask the government to bail you out and then resist basic public safety. Now, let me just say this. There, you've heard a lot of talk from my fellow Republicans, and I think that talk is very justified that we are the party of working people in this country. There's been a big political realignment in this country over the last 30 years, a political realignment that, frankly, I benefited from. We are the party of firefighters, of police officers, of the people who go to work pay their taxes, fight our country's wars, and keep our communities safe. We are proud of that, and we should be proud of that on the Republican Party, but now we are faced with a choice. With this legislation and how we respond to this crisis, do we do the bidding of a massive industry that is in bed with big government, or do we do the bidding of the people who elected us to the Senate and to the Congress in the first place? I believe that we are the party of working people, but it's time to be the party of working people. We have a choice. Are we for big business and big government, or are we for the people of East Palestine? It's a time for choosing. Let's make the right one. Thank you uh, very, very much. Senator Vance, th thank you, Senator Brown. My colleagues on this committee have heard me say uh, more than a few times, uh, bipartisan solutions are lasting solutions. And uh, I'm encouraged that, uh, that uh, there's a bipartisan spirit that's uh, afoot here, and I would urge you to continue to, to grow that, and we'll uh, try to kindle a, a support for it as well. With that uh, having been said, we're going to recognize a, our next panel of, of witnesses, and I want to call uh, the second panel of witnesses to come forward, and the uh, first witness will be Mr. Shaw. In addition to uh, Mr. Shaw, we will uh, be hearing from Deborah Shore, the Regional Administrator for Region 5 of the Environmental Protection Agency. Good morning, one and all. I think I've had a chance to uh, welcome you individually and personally. And uh, we uh, appreciate very much your, not only your presence here, but your willingness to share your, your thoughts and, uh, and ideas with, uh, with us as we try to make right uh, a, terrible, uh, a terrible wrong. We're going to turn to our first witness, and it's Alan Shaw. I appreciate the time you uh, spent with me on the phone uh, earlier this week. And Mr. Shaw, uh, you may uh, begin your testimony at this time. Thank you. Welcome. Good morning, Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and distinguished members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Alan Shaw, and I've been President and CEO of Norfolk Southern since May of 2022. I want to begin today by expressing how deeply sorry I am for the impact this derailment has had on the residents of East Palestine and the surrounding communities. I've been to East Palestine many times over the past month. I've talked with the leaders, the business owners, the school officials, the clergy, 
and others throughout the community. They've shared their stories and their concerns about the health of their families and the future of the community they love. I am determined to make this right. Norfolk Southern will clean the site safely, thoroughly, and with urgency. You have my personal commitment. Norfolk Southern will get the job done and help East Palestine thrive. At the direction of and in collaboration with the US EPA, state and local agencies, we are developing and implementing near and longer term cleanup activities. Air and water monitoring have been in place continuously since the accident. And to date, it consistently indicated that the air is safe to breathe and the water is safe to drink. In terms of community support, we have announced direct investments of over $21 million. We have provided support to more than 4,400 families through Norfolk Southern's Family Assistance Center. We established a $1 million fund available immediately to community leaders who will identify where donations can do the most good for East Palestine. We committed $7.5 million to Pennsylvania for a community relief fund, and we are reimbursing Pennsylvania emergency responders and health and environmental agencies for costs related to the derailment. All of this is just a down payment. We recently signed a lease for a more permanent space in East Palestine. I asked one of our frontline railroaders who lives in East Palestine to take on a new role as a full-time liaison, reporting directly to my office. He is advocating for the community in my office and overseeing distribution of another $1 million. We will be in the community for as long as it takes. To be clear, there are no strings attached to our assistance. If residents have a concern, we want them to come talk to us. Our website, nsmakingitright.com, provides the latest information and details on how to reach us. We have been cooperating fully with the NTSB's investigation into the cause of the derailment. The pre preliminary report found that the Norfolk Southern crew was operating the train below the speed limit and in an approved manner. Yet it is clear the safety mechanisms in place were not enough. As the NTSB continues its work, we are not waiting to act. Shortly after the, the derailment, I instructed my team to look at steps we could take to improve safety immediately. And we have announced a number of initiatives to do just that. These steps, these steps are just the start, and we look forward to working with policymakers and industry on others. We are also going to make our safety culture the best in the industry. The events of the last month are not who we are as a company. When I began my tenure as CEO 10 months ago, I spent hours in crew rooms all over our 22 state network, thanking our frontline railroaders and asking them for their advice. They are proud of the important work they do for the US economy and take safety seriously. I'm gonna make sure they've got the right training, the right processes, the right equipment, and the right technology. You have my commitment on that. Since becoming CEO, I have dedicated our company to charting a new course in the industry. I intend to continue working with industry stakeholders, including rail car owners, lessors, shippers, and other railroads to make industry-wide safety improvements. It's gonna take all of us, and Norfolk Southern is eager to lead that effort. Today, I'm proud to represent more than 19,700 Norfolk Southern employees who work every day to offer a safe and efficient means of transporting goods to businesses and families across our great country. When Norfolk Southern is successful, it is because our craft railroaders are getting the job done for our customers and the U.S. economy. 
thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you today. I look forward to your questions. Mr. Shaw, thanks uh, very much for joining us today. Thank you for, for that statement again for the time you spent with me on, on the phone recently. Uh, next, we're uh, pleased to, uh, to uh, welcome uh, Deborah Shore, uh, Deb, the uh, Regional Administrator for Region 5, the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, Ms. Shore, uh, you're welcome to, uh, to begin. Some things have been suggested that the EPA maybe hasn't done everything as well as they could have done, should have done. My sense is that uh, uh, EPA was on the, on the scene like within hours of the derailment. And uh, not only have you been there, a constant presence, but we've seen our, um, our administrator, uh, Michael Wiegand, uh, be there, and he'll be there uh, again. So and it's important. I commend you for that, and uh, we, we need for you to stay on the job, uh, right right on, on, the, on the scene. So thank you. You're, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and members of the committee for inviting me here today and for the opportunity to address your questions. I want to start by affirming that EPA's mission is to protect human health and the environment so that all communities across America have clean air, clean land, and clean water. The health and safety of those who've been affected by the Norfolk Southern train derailment is a top priority for me and for EPA. That's why as soon as EPA was notified of the train derailment on Friday, February 3rd, EPA personnel were on site in East Palestine within hours to support our state and local partners who are in the lead for emergency response efforts. Every day since, EPA has been boots on the ground, working in a bipartisan manner across all levels of government to help this community. I've personally been in East Palestine listening to residents and have heard how devastating this derailment has been. They are understandably worried and some are scared. And every time a train whistle blows, they're reminded of the trauma inflicted upon them by Norfolk Southern. That's why we've used one of EPA's most powerful enforcement tools to hold Norfolk Southern accountable and to require the company to clean up the mess it made. I want to be abundantly clear. The residents of the greater East Palestine community are not alone. EPA is with them and will continue to be with them for as long as it takes. Since the derailment, EPA has been leading robust air quality testing using state-of-the-art technology in and around East Palestine. We're currently conducting 24-7 air monitoring at 21 stations throughout the community. And I'm pleased to report that since the fire was extinguished on February 8th, EPA monitors have not detected any volatile organic compounds above levels of health concerns. While EPA is encouraged by the data, we also recognize that the people of East Palestine still question the health and safety of their community and their loved ones. In response, EPA has been assisting with indoor air screenings for homes through a voluntary program offered to residents to provide them with information and help restore their peace of mind. And as of March 4th, approximately 600 homes have been screened through this program and no detections of vinyl chloride or hydrogen chloride have been identified. On the water side, Ohio EPA, in partnership with the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, local health agencies, and public water systems, continues to lead water sampling efforts with EPA providing support. What I've described so far summarizes EPA's ongoing efforts to protect the health and safety of those living in East Palestine as well as in the surrounding areas of Ohio and Pennsylvania in the aftermath of this disaster. Now let me turn to how EPA is holding Norfolk Southern accountable. On February 21st, we issued a unilateral administrative order to Norfolk Southern, which includes a number of directives to identify and clean up contaminated soil and water resources, to attend and participate in public meetings at EPA's request and to post information online, to pay for EPA's costs for work performed under this order. EPA is overseeing Norfolk Southern's cleanup work to ensure it's done to EPA's specifications. The work plans will outline all steps necessary to clean up the environmental damage caused by the derailment. And most importantly, if the company fails to complete any of the EPA ordered actions, the agency will immediately step in 
conduct the necessary work, and then force Norfolk Southern to pay triple the cost. EPA's order holds Norfolk Southern accountable and facilitates in the transition from the multi-agency emergency response phase to a longer-term cleanup phase. Throughout my 11 days spent on the ground in East Palestine, I've learned that it is a proud and resilient community. Those that live there and in the surrounding communities have roots that go back generations. We owe it to these people to restore these beautiful communities to the special places we know they hold dear. That's exactly what EPA is working to accomplish, all while continuing to work hand in hand with our partners at the local, state, and federal levels. Again, thank you for inviting me here today. I look forward to the dialogue and to answering your questions. Fine. Uh, Ms. Shore, thank you so, so much. And thank uh, Conveyor, thanks to the, your colleagues at, at EPA for, the, for being there uh, right away on site and staying there right through uh, e even today. And uh, keep, uh, keep it up. Uh, everything uh, I do, I know I can do better. I think that's true, true of all of us. So I would just say let's find ways to do even better going forward. Thanks. Uh, Ann Vogel, and then uh, why don't you just start off your, your testimony with answering a question. Explain for folks might be watching this, how do we have like EPA here, Region 3 EPA, and we have Ohio EPA? How is that? Just take a minute and explain it. It won't count against your time. Thank you, Chairman. Ohio EPA is the Ohio agency dedicated to protecting health and human uh, human health and the environment, uh, similar to the work of the US EPA, which covers the whole nation. Oh, thank you. Go right ahead. We're delighted that you're here. Please proceed. Good morning, Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and members of the committee. My name is Ann Vogel, Director of the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency. On behalf of Governor DeWine, Lieutenant Governor Houston, and the talented team that I am privileged to represent at the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency, I thank you for allowing me to share our ongoing efforts to protect human health and the environment in East Palestine, a community that I have called home for the past month. Governor DeWine has been to the village regularly to reassure the community that while this is Norfolk Southern's train, their wreck, and their mess, the entire apparatus of state government has been mobilized to assist as East Palestine begins to recover from this traumatic experience. More than a dozen cabinet officials have spent time in East Palestine assessing short-term and long-term needs, answering questions, and standing up support operations such as the free health clinic in town. Ohio EPA has a dedicated team of experts, the emergency response team, with a combined 150 years of experience in environmental emergency management that responded to the derailment within one hour of being notified by the railroad. By 12.25 a.m. on February 4th, Ohio EPA was on the scene and immediately began the work of containing the release of chemicals into the nearby sulfur run. We have worked around the clock since that day to oversee removal of the gross contamination from the creeks in the immediate derailment area. Ohio EPA's oversight also includes ensuring the safety of residents served by the municipal water system in East Palestine. In the days immediately after the derailment, and now continuing on a weekly basis, the municipal wells are tested for a broad array of chemicals, and all lab reports have indicated that the public water system is safe. There have been no detections of contamination related to the derailment. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about Ohio EPA's response, but what I want to make sure that each of you here, along with the village of Palestine, is that the commitment to stay in East Palestine as long as it takes are not empty words. We live there. The work of Ohio EPA to restore the environment in East Palestine is just beginning. The emergency phase will continue as long as obvious known contamination remains. For example, we have a large presence on the ground right now as contaminated soil under the tracks is excavated. The investigation phase is also underway. Our oversight of Norfolk Southern's work plans along with our federal partners for things like soil testing, for track removal and replacement, for water sampling, will make sure that Norfolk Southern is taking all the right steps to remediate and protect East Palestine from potential long-term hazards. We have installed monitoring wells at the site of the derailment to test for potential contamination to groundwater now and in the future. We have installed sentinel wells for long-term sampling of groundwater. This is part of an early detection system 
that will tell us if contamination is approaching the municipal well field. We will test municipal water systems on a, day, on a weekly basis, and we'll do that using our own labs. We will continue to be 100% transparent, sharing complete lab results immediately. We will attend open houses and town halls and be present in the community, answering questions and refuting misinformation with facts. The data that we collect from each sample, each test, each observation, informs the next step that we will take along the path to long-term full remediation. You and your constituents have many of the same questions that I hear from residents of East Palestine every day. How long will we test the water? How long until the fish come back? Can I play in the yard and eat out of my garden? How or when will we know if the damage to our village is worse than we thought or even irreparable? These are legitimate questions, and I am committed to finding answers. I can promise East Palestine that Governor DeWine, his administration, and the whole team at the Ohio EPA will not stop until the science definitively shows that the residents of East Palestine are safe in their community. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thanks uh, very much, Ms. Vogel. Uh, please convey our best to uh, Mike DeWine, who used to serve here, and he and I were governors uh, and congressmen uh, together as well. Thank you, sir. Um, for some people who are watching uh, this, uh, uh, joining us from uh, across the country, they may be wondering why we have an EPA uh, Region 3 uh, uh, affiliate. The EPA has 10 regional uh, regions that they, they operate and that they're responsible for. One of them is, is here represented today for uh, Ohio. The um, Ohio, Delaware and, um, and West Virginia are in Region 3. That's in Pennsylvania, so the, the three of us are, are all a region, region three. The, um, every state has a, a state agency that focuses on environmental protection. In Delaware, it's the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control. And in Ohio, uh, where I spent a lot of years of my life uh, as a kid, uh, the, uh, the, it's, it's EPA uh, Ohio. So we're delighted that you're here and, and, and rep representing the, the governor and the state. Next, uh, it's, uh, we're going to hear from Mr. Richard Harrison, the Executive Director and Chief uh, Engineer for the Ohio River Valley Water Sanitation Commission, or, or SANCO. I'm not real big on, uh, on acronyms. Uh, so tell us, uh, Mr. Uh, before you even start your testimony, Mr. Harrison, tell us what is or SANCO. So uh, anybody happens to be catching this on the, the television across the country says, oh, OK, I understand that. We are an interstate commission, sir, and we um represent uh, eight states within the Ohio River Basin, and we work on protecting the water quality, the water uses of the interstate waters of the basin. We've been here about 75 years doing this great work. All right. Have you been there for all those 75? <laughs> Probably not. Almost. All right. No. All right. Thank you. Go right ahead, Mr. Harris. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and members of the committee. My name is Richard Harrison. Executive Director and Chief Engineer of the Ohio River Valley Water Sanitation Commission, we're known as Orsenko. We're an interstate commission that carries out our compact signed by eight states, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia, with approval by the United States Congress and participation by the federal government. Since its inception in 1948, Orsenko has worked to improve and protect the water quality of the interstate waters of the Ohio River Basin. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before this committee today regarding Orsenko's efforts as part of an exceptional partnership to respond to the East Palestine train derailment and downstream impact on the Ohio River. Orsenko Complex specifies the protection of the interstate waters of the Ohio River Basin as a safe and suitable public industrial water supply after reasonable treatment. This is a critical service that Orsenko provides to the 30 Ohio River surface drinking water utilities to supply the millions of customers uh, that rely on them for safe drinking water. Orsenko's ability to excel in this type of response is only possible through the combined efforts of our partners, including the Ohio River Drinking Water Utilities, our member states and governors, the United States EPA, the United States Army Corps of Engineers, and other federal partners. I must highlight Ohio Governor DeWine, the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency, and US EPA Region 5 for their on-scene leadership in this particular response. And the Greater Cincinnati Water Works, uh, GCWW, who provided critical laboratory analysis for new, numerous samples on a 24-7 basis. Orsenko has an extraordinary team of 22 professionals and a total annual budget of $3.9 million. This is below our 2003 budget level. I'm very proud of the strong value our organization provides to our many partners that was most recently demonstrated through our successful response to the diluted chemical spill remnants of this event 
that reach the Ohio River. The foundation of our chemical response is our staff's coordination with our partners, utilizing our Sanko's organic detection system, ODS. The ODS includes 16 scientific laboratory instruments owned and operated by Orsenko, um, and then on scene operated by the Ohio River drinking water utilities themselves. This system provided the early warning that chemicals from the derailment had reached the Ohio River. The ODS has subsequently provided over 40,000 screening level test results for 30 volatile organic chemicals. Over 130 special samples of the Ohio River were collected by my scientist and analyzed by Greater Cincinnati Water Works Laboratory. The proximity of the leading edge of the diluted spill remnants was tracked by Orsenko's time of travel computer model and confirmed by daily sampling completed by our scientists. This information proved invaluable to our partners. N-butyl acrylate, 2-ethyl hexanol, and 2-ethyl hexyl acrylate were detected through Orsenko's initial sampling efforts from the Little Beaver Creek, the tributary below East Palestine that feeds the Ohio River near the Ohio River and Pennsylvania border. As a result, we were able to calibrate six of our more sophisticated ODS stations to quantify any detections of these chemicals that may be found in the remnants. The Agency of Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, ATSDR, provided invaluable, timely provisional health guidance screening levels for these chemicals to determine what level might pose a health risk to finished drinking water. These screening levels were 560 parts per billion for two uh, ethyl hex hexyl acrylate and 200 parts per billion for two ethyl hexanol. Um, our highest Ohio River detection for N-butyl acrylate was 4.3 parts per billion, and the analysis results for the other two chemicals were all below one part per billion. The ATSDR health screening levels and Orsenko's ODS and special sampling data analysis provided the scientific foundation for our conclusion that there were no Ohio River detections at any levels approaching the concern to public health. This information was tabulated, posted on Orsenko's website, and communicated to the public. Orsenko's ability to provide this high level of chemical spill response is dependent upon our ability to secure sustainable funding through the fiscal 2024 federal appropriations process. This includes the organic detection system. If the recent accident has taught us anything, it is that we depend on the system and our capable staff and partners to respond to threats to our drinking water supply. The current ODS equipment was last funded by Congress in 2009 and needs replacement at an approximate cost of $4.7 million. In short, Orsanko pro provided the level of service that our customers have depended on, and without this federal investment, uh, this will be a challenge in the future. Let me thank the committee once again for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Mr. Harrison, uh, our thanks to you and everyone at Orsanko for, uh, for your testimony today, for being with us, and uh, keep, uh, stay on it, uh, please. Uh, Eric uh, Brewer, Eric, uh, uh, welcome. Uh, I understand you serve as the director and, and chief of hazardous materials response for Beaver County Department of Emergency Services, not that far from uh, East Palestine. And uh, Senator Capito has already mentioned the, uh, just gave a shout out to the first responders who've uh, turned out and, and as, as a former governor who's uh, spent a lot of time uh, with uh, the disasters of our own uh, in the state of, uh, De of Delaware, uh, we know how important the work of the first responders are. We're grateful for their service and, uh, and sacrifice. So thank you, convey, convey, con please convey our, our, our gratitude. And with that, you're recognized to make your statement. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before you in reference to the emergency in East Palestine that's directly affecting the residents of Beaver County, Pennsylvania. Uh, this derailment occurred just under 1,000 feet from the Pennsylvania-Ohio line. <clears throat> I'm Eric Brewer, Director of Emergency Services for Beaver County. I'm the appointed emergency management coordinator as well as the chief of the hazardous materials response team. I've been with the department for 28 years. I'm speaking as a member of the community as well as a first responder who was on scene the night of the derailment. My family has been in Beaver County for over 100 years. I was born, raised, and continue to reside there. I'm part of the community. I'm not an expert on air quality, water quality, or rail cars. Beaver County is located in southwest Pennsylvania, approximately 20 miles northwest of the city of Pittsburgh. On Friday, February 3rd, at about 9.15 p.m., I was contacted by the Emergency Management Director of Columbiana County, Ohio. She was en route to a train derailment near the county line and requested mutual aid from the Beaver County Hazmat team. 18 fire departments from Beaver County also responded to assist. We arrived at the command post about 10.15, which was set up at the Leak Oil Gas Station. On arrival, there was active fire among several rail cars. Our mission was to obtain the train consist 
and start to research the contents of the tank cars. Norfolk Southern hazmat personnel and contractors arrived on scene shortly after 11 p.m. At around midnight, after research of the contents, it was decided to shut down fire operations and move firefighters out of the immediate area and to let the tank cars burn. Uh, this is not an unusual decision. decision made, this decision was made primarily by Norfolk Southern Hazmat Coordinator as well as their contractor. And based on that initial information, we decided to initiate a one-mile shelter in place from an intersection just east of Lee Coyle. This put the one-mile radius just into Beaver County. That fire eventually burned out Sunday morning. Sunday evening, we received a call from Columbiana County EMA and advised us that railroad officials were concerned about one of the tank cars starting to heat up. There was a possibility of explosion and that we should, con should consider a one-mile evacuation. Ohio officials notified us that the one-mile radius would now be from the leak oil address. This would add additional residents from Beaver County in the one-mile evacuation zone. Darlington Township officials went door-to-door -door, as well as using a mass, notifica mass notification system to advise the residents of the one-mile recommended evacuation. It was stressed that this was a recommendation as we cannot force residents from their homes. Social media posts began to circulate stating that arrests would be made if people refused to leave during the evacuation. Let me be clear, this was not the case in Pennsylvania as this was not a mandatory evacuation. Monday morning, we assembled at the Emergency Operations Center in East Palestine. We learned that Norfolk Southern wanted to do a controlled detonation of the tank car in question. We were assured this was the safest way to mitigate the problem. Um, during one of those planning meetings, we learned from Nor Norfolk Southern that they now wanted to do the controlled detonation on five of the tank cars rather than just the one. This changed the entire plan as it would now impact a much larger area. Uh, I think this confusion was probably a result of the lack of communication from Norfolk Southern and the fact that uh, they, they weren't present during these planning, planning meetings. The governors of Ohio and Pennsylvania made it clear to, to Norfolk Southern that they needed to communicate better. After more planning, the controlled detonation eventually occurred around 4.40 p.m. Most of the area concerned in Beaver County is rural and uses well water. There's no municipal water system in that area. Since the Monday of the controlled detonations, we fielded thousands of calls from concerned citizens wanting to know if they can drink the water, feed their livestock, and if the air is good. I continue to get asked about how prepared areas are for a train derailment. Emergency management consists of several phases and one of those is preparedness. The goal of preparedness is to lessen the impact of a disaster, not prevent it. As Senator Vance said, uh, there will continue to be disasters, however, we can lessen the impact through preparedness. Although it should not take an emergency such as this, I hope this is an impetus for better support of emergency management programs. Most emergency man management programs across the country have outdated laws, are underfunded, and understaffed. In closing, this was a train wreck. There was not a script for this. There wasn't a binder for me labeled train wreck. Everyone needs to know we did the best we could with the information we had. And in the end, there were no, one, no responders were killed or injured during response. My message has been consistent. I want the residents and first responders of Beaver County to be treated the same as those in East Palestine. Now, the cost of this emergency should not be a burden to the taxpayers of Beaver County nor any of the local municipalities. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brewer, thank you, and uh, thanks again to you and uh, really the good people who throughout this country are willing to get up in the middle of the night and risk their lives for the rest of us. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask some questions now. I'll turn it to Senator Capito for her questions, and, and uh, we'll go hear from uh, some of our other, uh, other colleagues. Uh, I, have a, I, I don't ask a lot of uh, yes or no questions, Mr. Shaw. I'm going to ask a few today, and i just ask you to, to answer them. We'll keep it short and just answer yes or no if you can. When I think about uh, the train uh, derailment and chemical disaster that continues to impact the people of East Palestine and surrounding communities, I can't help but think, what if this happened in my neighborhood to my own family? We have uh, a fairly heavy uh, train travel, freight train travel throughout northern Delaware, and our communities are used to seeing those trains move throughout our state. Uh, what if uh, there were burning toxic uh, trains outside of our window uh, in our community, damaging our air, our water, and possibly making my family and our neighbors sick? What if uh, this disaster lowered the value of our home, our business, and I worked uh, my, I worked my whole life uh, to uh, build, 
And, and I'd be honest, I'd be, I'd be furious. And I think most of us would be, and we'd want to make sure that Norfolk Southern took action to make our families and our communities whole. Uh, my first question is to you are just simple yes or no questions. We've got three of them. And uh, I think uh, the Americans, if they were here, if they get them all in this room, uh, a lot of them would ask the same uh, questions if this happened in, in their uh, towns. Yes, yes or no, will you commit that Norfolk Southern will be there for the, as long as it takes to make East Palestine, Ohio, Darlington Township in Pennsylvania and the surrounding communities whole from this disaster, yes or no? Senator, thank you for that question. Um, <clears throat> I understand that concern. That's the same concern that is shared with me by the residents of East Palestine and Darlington Township. Um, I'm terribly sorry for the impact this derailment has had on the folks of that community. And yes, it's my personal commitment and Norfolk Southern's commitment that we're gonna be there for as long as it takes to help East Palestine thrive and recover. That's my personal commitment. I take that as a yes, thank you. That's the answer I was looking for. Next question, will you commit that Norfolk Southern will compensate the people in these communities for uh, possible long-term medical costs and economic damages resulting from this disaster, yes or no, please. Senator, we're committed to doing what's right for the folks of East Palestine and the community. That's been my personal commitment since the day after this happened. I pulled my team together and I told my team, we are gonna do more than less with the environmental cleanup and we're gonna do more than less with the citizens of East Palestine. And my third question is, uh, yes or no, will you commit to paying for long-term medical testing for people in the impacted communities to ensure that anyone with known or suspected exposure to dangerous chemicals due to this disaster is monitored for adverse health effects? Yes or no? Senator, I'm, I'm committed to doing what's right. You know, we're gonna be there today, tomorrow, a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. I, I've told the community that. I've been there in person. I've looked into their eyes. I've heard their concerns. I've been in their family rooms. I'm committed to that community, and so was Norfolk Southern. All right, thank you for that. My, uh, my second question uh, would be for Administrator Shore. Uh, I uh, commend EPA, I wanna commend uh, its employees and leadership for being in East Palestine, and at least for the rank and file to be there within hours of the accident, and for the hard work that uh, you and others have been doing every day since then to get the contamination cleaned up. I also commit uh, EPA, commend the EPA for continuing to listen and respond to the community's concerns, including adapting the monitoring and sampling to ensure that any adverse environmental impacts and possible significant health effects from this disaster are known and addressed. Administrator Regan's uh, level of personal involvement here is, I believe, unprecedented in anything that I've seen in my, in my experience. My question, so um, I think I know the answer, but I will ask you uh, the same thing I ask Mr. Shaw, and that is, do you commit that EPA will be there for as long as it takes to protect the public health and environment of the impacted communities? Thank you, Senator Carper. Yes, EPA is committed to continue to work with our partners in the community and make sure they have the support that they need and deserve. EPA will be on the ground as long as it takes. All right, thank you. My last question that I will ask is uh, as, uh, to, uh, Director Vogel to you and to uh, Mr. Brewer. Uh, before this hearing, I had the opportunity to speak with several of the officials involved in response to this incident, including governors of Ohio and Pennsylvania. Governor Shapiro shared with me a letter they had sent to Norfolk Southern on February 14, 2023. The letter asserts that Norfolk Southern did not communicate well with state and local agencies in the early days of the response, which led to confusion as well as concerns that alternative options for safe, safely removing the chemicals were not adequately considered. In your experience, did you receive the information that you needed 
from Norfolk Southern to adequately make decisions relating to protecting public health and safety? Were there any gaps in communications from Norfolk Southern to responding agencies in the first 72 hours of the derailment that may uh, have contributed to distrust within the impact of the communities? And if so, has Norfolk Southern satisfactorily addressed any such uh, communications gaps since that time? Ms. Vogel. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your question. I do believe there were quite a few gaps in communication and missteps in the very early hours of the following the derailment. I do believe that those gaps in communication have been addressed. I believe the teams are working well together on the ground today. But yes, things could have been handled better in the beginning hours. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Brewer, same, same question. Were there uh, any gaps in communications from Norfolk Southern to responding agencies in the first 72 hours or so of the derailment that may have contributed to stress within the impacted communities? And if so, has Norfolk Southern, Southern uh, satisfactorily addressed such communications gaps since that time? Thank you. The, uh, the boots on the ground crews were great to work with. Um, it seems as bosses or management, management gets there, um, that's where the, the communication failures start. And that's probably why we're here today, that the um, decision to go from the one tank car to the five was jaw dropping. Um, and, and that impact, just because of the impact it had. Um, since then, it, it, they did seem to get better though. All right, thank you. Senator Capito, you're recognized uh, for your questions. Thank you, uh, panel. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. and Thank you for your testimony. Um, I, my, it's my understanding, this is sort of a table setting question here, that no one, not the EPA, not the state, not Norfolk Southern, has been making these cleanup decisions in a vacuum. That uh, instead a unified command group of these entities and experts have all had um, input into these major decisions. So for everybody who's here, could I sh have a show of hands or whose organization is represented in this unified command group? Do you have a comment? We, we used to be, used. up until like last week or so. Okay. E EMA is involved, but it's a Columbia. Okay, thank you. And then um, is that a fair assessment that I made forward that these decisions are not made individually, they're made by the unified command? Just you can shake your heads yes, if you don't, if you disagree, you can shake. All right, thank you. Um, so I, I, I mentioned in my opening statement, I want to go right to the EPA, uh, to Director Shore, and thank you for being on the ground early. I commended you in my opening statement in your organization. I understand that, you know, and this may be something we get into a little bit later, you got Region 5, Region 3, so you, you know, within a thousand, what was it, a thousand feet of uh, Pennsylvania. I'm concerned now about something Senator Vance talked about, and this is the hazard of waste disposal that we're seeing right now. Apparently. There are piles and piles of the sitting there right now and um, not moving. And I understand that facilities in Michigan and Texas that received waste from East Palestine are some of the most qualified in the entire country. The U.S. Ecology Facility in Michigan, for instance, had already accepted 360 tons of soil and 3,000 gallons of liquid in full compliance with their permits. The EPA has stopped, uh, they have failed to give us an answer on what legal authority you used to stop those trucks at the gates of the facility that had already been accepting large volumes of waste. You said in your statement that this is great news because it means the cleanup can continue at a rapid pace. If it's still sitting there, I, 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 would, uh, I would say that's a, a, a contrarian kind of, uh, I mean, that's a, in opposition of what we're seeing. So um, all shipments of contaminated soils have been suspended on site. Uh, to test for dioxins, something that might, uh, should have possibly been done weeks ago, but um, there was an insistence, I think, that the, uh, the dioxin uh, concerns were um, not as uh, severe as what now you're going back and testing. So let me be clear, this is just, I, it goes to this whole mixed messages of what's going on here. So help me understand why you have delaying this cleanup efforts, uh, why the, the, piles are still piling up because, you know, any anytime you get there, it, 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 it disturbs not just the, the chemicals, but it, it brings the odor and then here comes the lack of trust right back down onto the community. Uh, and so could you say, could you help me with this? Is it true that most of the remaining contaminated soil is, is still sitting there in East Palestine and, and when are you going to get it out of there and where are you going to take it? 
or I know you're not doing it. Norfolk Southern's doing it. Go ahead. We, uh, yeah. Senator Capito, thank you for that. First, I want to thank you for acknowledging the heroic efforts of all the emergency responders who were on the scene within hours, including EPA on scene coordinators from both Region 3 and Region 5. And I have them at the front of mine every day, and thanks for acknowledging their efforts. Let me report that waste is moving off site, even as recently as yesterday and today. Where is it going? Where is it going from the site? Uh, to a number of facilities that are EPA approved, that have the capacity to receive the waste, that have contracts with Norfolk Southern, and that have gone through our due diligence and a compliance review, which is necessary once federal EPA issued the order and assumed authority for the cleanup work from Ohio EPA. And we did pause to conduct that necessary due diligence and compliance review because then all the facilities fell under the CERCLA regulations. Norfolk Southern engages facilities wherever they may be to accept solid and liquid waste. It's EPA's responsibility to ensure that the safeguards are in place for that waste in the loading, transport, and unloading, to make sure that they're compliant with our regulations, and to make sure that they have the capacity to take the waste. I can share some good news with you that the results from the dioxin testing that Indiana requested came in yesterday, and they're very low levels. So we expect waste to be moving perhaps as soon as today, to other facilities. No option is off the table. Okay, so I'd like to see a list of the facilities, and I'd also like to ask just quickly, if I can have just another minute, why did you wait a month before you started to order the dioxin testing when the community was asking for this? Was that a decision that you made early on that it wasn't uh, critical, or uh, how was this decision made? Senator Capito, our air monitoring was searching for primary indicators, mm -hmm. such as phosgene and hydrogen chloride, immediately during and after the burn. We detected very low levels, which very quickly went even down to non-detect. Without those primary indicators, it was a very low probability that dioxins would have been created. They are secondary byproducts of the burning of vinyl chloride. But we were listening to the community, and they expressed significant concerns about dioxins. Norfolk Southern has submitted a soil sampling plant. It's undergone review by the Unified Command, and our folks will be out sampling soils for dioxins there's a meeting with agriculture representatives this afternoon. Yeah, well, thank you. The, I mean, the air issue is obviously 30 days late is a little bit well uh, well past the time when the intensity might might have been felt more. But thank you for your answers. Thank you. Thanks for those questions. And uh, I'm now, now going to take a, a couple of minutes and, and ask a few questions that uh, were submitted by uh, Senator Fetterman, who can't join us today. But the first question would be to uh, is re respond is re with regards to uh, railway safety, uh, the bill that's been introduced by several of our colleagues who have spoken here earlier. And my first question is to Mr. Shaw. In light of the derailment in uh, East Palestine and the subsequent derailment and train crash that both happened in the last uh, week, the National Transportation Safety Board and the federal Railroad Administration have both announced that they will be conducting investigations into the safety of your company. The U.S. Department of Transportation has called on Norfolk Southern to act urgently to improve your focus on safety. And additionally, I, along with Senators Brown, Casey, and Vance, have introduced a bill that would impose common sense measures to improve rail safety. And uh, Ms. Senator Fetterman's question is, is this. Will you commit to supporting the Bipartisan Railway Safety Act and help restore the public's trust in your company? Go ahead. Senator, thank you for that question. We are committed to the legislative intent to make rail safer. 
Norfolk Southern runs a safe railroad. And it's my commitment to improve that safety and make our safety culture the best in the industry. Just last year, derailments on Norfolk Southern were the lowest they had been in the last 10 years. And our personal injury rate is amongst the lowest in the industry. As you and I spoke about yesterday, we can always get better. And that is my intent, is to continue to invest and continue to improve. All right, thank you. Uh, as a, as a follow-up uh, from uh, Senator Fetterman, uh, he'd like for me to ask you, if you, do, if you don't support the bill in its entirety, are there specific provisions of the Bipartisan Rail Safety Act that Norfolk Southern could support? Yes, Senator, there are a, a number of provisions that we would absolutely support. The rail industry has been in support of tighter tank car standards for a number of years, and I understand that's in the bill. We support more training and more funding for first responders. We support enhanced wayside detector technology. And in fact, Norfolk Southern is leading the industry in a number of ways. You saw just this week a six-point safety plan that included a number of issues in which we're implementing immediately to improve safety, including installing more wayside detectors. The first one was installed yesterday outside of East Palestine. All right, thank you. Another uh, question for you, Ms., uh, Mr. Shaw. One more question from uh, Senator Fetterman. Uh, his staff has heard from local officials in Darlington Township that Norfolk Southern began giving inconvenience, that's a, in a quote, inconvenience stipends to individuals with an East Palestine zip code. After requests from Darlington uh, Beaver County, uh, Senator Fetterman, along with Senator Casey and Congressman Delosio, uh, Norfolk Southern extended their the inconvenience stipend, but it's still not clear how wide that area covers. And Senator Fetterman asked, can you please clarify whether uh, Pennsylvanians who left their homes after the railmen are entitled to this financial assistance from uh, Norfolk Southern? Yes, thank you for that question. I, I'm, again, terribly sorry for the impact and the disruption that this has had on the local communities. I am proud of the fact that Norfolk Southern had established a family assistance center within 24 hours of the derailment. And we've assisted well over 4,400 families, including families from Pennsylvania. And earlier this week, we announced a much more comprehensive package totaling $7.5 million for Pennsylvania. And again, sir, that's just a down payment. All right. Uh, a follow-up to that, uh, <clears throat> Senator Fetterman says uh, they, uh, they believe, he believes they need more insight into how Norfolk Southern coordinated with Pennsylvania agencies in the immediate response to the derailment. And while the national attention has been focused on the Ohio side, this derailment incurred less, as you know, less than a mile from the Pennsylvania border. And Pennsylvanians live directly down when from the chemical release and burn. Um, question, uh, Mr. Shaw, this is, again, this is Senator Fetterman's question. Uh, why weren't the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency and Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection contacted until hours after the derailment? And is there a process in place to notify the relevant state agencies when a derailment of train cars containing hazardous materials occurs? If so, why hasn't this process been followed in this instance? Senator, the, the process that's established is part of the Department of Homeland Security presidential directive that was established in 2003. My understanding is Norfolk Southern immediately contacted the National Response Center, which then contacted applicable federal, state, and local authorities. All right. Now uh, we're going to turn to uh, Senator uh, Mullen. For, for his questions. Thank, Thank you, for Chairman. Responses. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm going to add to uh, Senator Capito's question to Ms. Shaw, but I'm, or to Ms. Shore. I'm, I'm going to ask Mr. Shaw, would you speak to the fact that uh, the waste is being disposed at at a facility 17 miles from East Palestine? 
I'm sorry, Senator, could you repeat the question? Well, we've got reports that East Liverpool in Ohio is, uh, is receiving this waste from East Palestine that has been, um, has been disposed of. Is that accurate? Senator, standing here today, I don't know if that's accurate as of this time. So do you know where the waste is going to then? It is. Um, we're in the process of working with the EPA on a number of facilities. So we haven't identified where it's moving to yet. Senator, we're in the process of working with the EPA on a number of facilities that... I understand that. I'm just... But the, I'm just... I get you're in the process, but we haven't identified a place for this to be removed to yet. Is Senator, that accurate? Senator, I want to make sure I give you the most accurate... I get that. Yeah, I'm just saying, is it accurate that we don't have a spot yet for it? Senator, we are moving some off-site. Where is it I'm, moving to? I'm... I'm I'm happy to give you a, a list of those facilities. Could you do that for us, please? I, I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Shaw, um, when, the, when the vent and burn process was being made, uh, who, who made those decisions and what was other considerations other than just burning it and letting the, letting the material burn off? Thank you for that question. The only consideration, Senator, was the safety and health of the community. And that decision was made by unified command under the direction of the incident commander. Who's, who's, who's that? The incident commander was Fire Chief Drabeck. Norfolk Southern was a part of unified command. So who owns the car? Who actually owned the rail car or the material in it? The, the rail car in question are tank cars of which no railroad owns. Okay, were they, in, were they considered in this decision making? Are they responsible for the content of it and the car itself, for the maintenance and the material in it? Isn't that correct? Senator, it's a, it's a privately owned rail car, and mm -hmm. so the maintenance requirements for that rail car are between the rail car lessor and the customer, and those are private contracts I'm not privy to. But are the, you're not, they're responsible for the content and the car, correct? Making sure it's operating properly? Yes, sir. Okay, were they considered in this, in this decision making? Considering it was their car, their design, their responsibility, were they part of that decision making on being able to vent it and burn it? Senator, the, uh, the customer provided input. Were they in the room when the decision was being made? No. I've, been, I've received reports that they weren't, so they weren't in the room? No, sir. Not to my knowledge. I, I just seen that kind of hard to believe that considering that it's their car, it's their responsibility, and they weren't even considered before this decision to vent and burn it in the middle of a town. Doesn't that seem like possibly a mistake there? Senator, Unified Command was focused solely on the health and safety of the community. <sighs> Right, I so the people that was in charge of the car should probably have a say in that to make sure we know the best way to dispose of it. My understanding at the time from talking to experts was that we were at risk of a catastrophic rupture that would have resulted in uncontrolled release of hazardous materials. But it's my understanding, and I haven't been able to clarify this, that the, that the report that I, was, that I received was the fact that the car was actually working properly at the time. Uh, but the car's owners, the ones that were responsible for it, wasn't consulted before it was burned off. Now, I haven't been able to verify that, but I'm asking these questions because that's the information that I received. And if that's the case, I think that's, a, that's an area for improvement. Wouldn't you consider that? Senator, I, I can't comment on the accuracy of that report. I'm not aware of that. But I'm saying if it's accurate, if that was accurate, wouldn't you consider that's a place that we could probably learn from? I think the primary concern was the health and the safety of the community. Sir, I get what you're saying, you're, you're, and, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful to you. But I'm saying is if all parties that's responsible for that car should have been part of that decision making. And because and, I believe they would probably be saying that they, were, they would be concerned too. I think everybody in this room will say that we're concerned about the health and safety of others. That's, that's a give me. So there's no point in repeating that. I'm just saying, how can we learn from this going forward? If they weren't in the room during the decision making, and yet it was their car, and the report may be accurate that the car was actually working functionally correctly, because those cars are designed for this kind of incident, that 
the option to vent and burn may not have been the best option if we didn't consider all other options first. Senator, I understand that. The experts on the ground who were there were very concerned about the pressure in a car. Right. We also noted that other cars had been in a pool fire and their unified command was aware that there was a concern for a catastrophic explosion that would shoot VCM gas and shrapnel. I, I hear you. I, we're just talking in circles here. Chairman, what I'm trying to get to is the fact that if this car was designed by someone else and if this car was owned by somebody else and the function of that car was designed by somebody else and was responsible by somebody else, then how do we know that the car wasn't working properly to begin with? And that's a question that needs to be answered because someone may need to be held responsible that made the decision to burn this off. Because some of this and a lot of this could have been pre pre prevented. With that, I'll yield back. All right. Thank you uh, very much for those questions. And uh, Senator Cardin, you're next. Thanks. Thanks for joining us, man. Well, first, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, thank you very much for um, uh, scheduling this hearing. I want to thank all the witnesses that are at the table. And yes, I am very concerned that this was a preventable accident, preventable circumstance. The safety standards uh, sh should have been able to deal with this. There needs to be full accountability. Uh, we need to make changes moving forward. We have concerns about uh, corporate responsibility and decisions made at the corporate level. All that are areas that are of grave concern, I think, to every member of this committee. I represent the state of Maryland. The Ohio River may not flow through the state of Maryland, but its watershed does impact water in Maryland. So I'm interested, if I can, Mr. Harrison and Ms. Vogel, if I can get your understanding of how you're monitoring the quality of water uh, as a result of this incident. What concerns me is that we have extreme, more extreme weather events that are occurring uh, in our communities. And as you're doing your monitoring, what precautions are you taking for extreme weather events that are likely to occur and the impact that that could have, not just on Ohio and Pennsylvania, but perhaps even on Maryland, as it relates to uh, water quality or even air quality? Thank you, Senator, for that question. Uh, I, will, I will speak to the work Orsenko has been doing uh, to protect the Ohio River. Uh, drinking water supply, and it really, um, really uh, hinges on on our great organics detection system, which is a number of scientific uh, instruments, including six that are GC mass specs, which are very sophisticated instruments. We've been able to calibrate those for the various chemicals that we were able to detect, and those continue to operate. So in addition to being able to utilize those for uh, one-off sampling, that we did is we, we tracked the spill remnants all the way um, through uh, over 700 miles down the Ohio River. We're continuing to operate those. Actually, our drinking water utilities are continuing to operate those on a daily basis. And so that system remains uh, in, in operation and will continue to be in operation as long as, as necessary. So we're able to detect those chemicals and any uh, threads that might come through through rain. I am involved uh, in the Unified Command, except for today. And we have anywhere from two to three meetings a day, and we are abreast of the on-site conditions that may occur. And last week's rain, for instance, uh, we were able to demonstrate with our equipment that we did not detect any of the chemicals of concern. And in regards to groundwater sources? We do not work in the groundwater arena. Our compact focuses on surface water. Ms. Vogel, can you add to this? Senator Cardin, thank you for your question. We appreciate the work of Orsenko. My team on the ground uh, from AEP Ohio is sampling the surface water every single day. We're taking samples in 20 different locations. We have a website set up, an interactive map where you can see exactly where we're sampling and what we're sampling for. It's a broad array of chemicals of concern, but also uh, volatile organic chemicals generally. We're posting those results. We're continuing to see dilution of the chemicals of concern. So we, I, I just want to be very transparent and say we will continue to sample as long as we find any detections, but it does seem to be fading. On the groundwater side, Senator, we have installed monitoring wells at the location of the derailment 
We've also installed Sentinel wells near Sulphur Run and Leslie, uh, between them and the municipal well field, so that we will be able to test those on a weekly basis and know if there are any contaminants that might be approaching uh, any groundwater or uh, drinking water. And are you being totally transparent as you are doing this so that those of us that have concerns, particularly about impacts of extreme weather events, will be able to get contemporary assurances that the monitoring is being done? Yes, Senator. It's the number one priority of the team on the ground to prevent any additional releases through rain events or of course, from going any further than the initial contaminated area, that is our number one goal with water management right now. But in terms of transparency, we're posting full lab results the minute we get them. Um, the, the governor's very committed to being transparent and providing all of the information that we have when we have it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, and, and thank you very much for joining us today. I, uh, my, I was told that uh, Senator Ricketts is uh, next in line, and uh, if you're ready, uh, I yield to you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you to all the panelists for joining us here today. And of course, uh, Nebraskans are praying for the people of East Palestine and uh, this terrible tragedy. We've got a number of railroads that go across our state as well. And so we're praying for a good outcome here with regard to the cleanup. Uh, Ms. Shore, uh, I'd like to address my first couple questions to you. I'm sure you agree that Americans deserve timely and helpful updates when it comes to an environmental catastrophe, right? Yeah. That was, she nodded yes, okay, great. And you agree that Americans uh, should be confident when they return to their homes uh, that they're safe to return to, right? Okay. So what, have, what are some of the things that the EPA has learned from with your response here that you would use to be able to improve going forward with regard to, you know, we've, we've heard how the people of East Palestine are not believing what the government's saying. What can the EPA do, or what have you learned from this, to be able to help for the next incident, to be able to help the people of that community get the information, feels like it's safe to return to their homes? Thank you, Senator Ricketts. And first, let me say I bring greetings from your sister, Laura, who's been a longtime friend of mine back in Illinois. Okay. Uh, and uh, to your question, we are still enmeshed in the cleanup of the derailment. And that's our primary focus. We need to clean up the site, get the contaminated waste out of there, and then focus on the longer term remediation. There will be an after action report and we'll be able to drill in on what lessons we can learn and how we can do better. But right now, we need to clean up this site as safely and quickly as possible and ensure that the necessary safeguards are in place to protect human health and the environment. All right, thank you, Ms. Shaw. Mr. Shaw, I'm gonna ask you basically the same questions. So I'm sure you agree that Americans should have timely information when there's a catastrophe like this, right? Yes, sir, there's, uh, it, it's, a, it's an emotional issue and it was a devastating derailment for the folks of East Palestine. Um, that's one of the reasons that we set up our Family Assistance Center within 24 hours and have served 4,400 families. We've also established a website, nsmakingitright.com. That's based on feedback that I've gotten from the community mm -hmm. as I've walked around and, and talked to people. They want more information, sir. Yeah. And so I'm sure you agree that people want to know when it's safe to go back to their homes as well. What has Norfolk Southern learned from this that would help them to be able to provide that information to people so that they can feel comfortable in going back into their homes and they're getting the proper information in a timely way? What, what have you learned about what you would do differently going forward? You know, Senator, um, in the immediate aftermath of this derailment, we had air monitoring in place. We had water monitoring in place. We've been collaborating with the EPA. Um, my understanding is all the tests have shown that the air is safe and the water is safe. Senator, to your point, um, when we set up our website, I asked the citizens of East Palestine for feedback. I asked them to tell me how we could make it better. And they, what they have asked for is information on that website on the results of those air tests 
and the water test. And Senator, they, we, I've also made sure that we point um, folks to the results of the Ohio EPA and the federal EPA air and water tests. They're the experts and we're here to support them. Mm -hmm. So is there anything in hindsight that you'd say, hey, we should have done this better when it comes to how we're communicating with the people of East Palestine? You know, Senator, there's, there are always opportunities to improve communication. I was there very soon after the derailment. Um, I w immediately went to the Norfolk Southerners Family Assistance Center, and I immediately went to the Red Cross shelter. And I told them who I was, and I told them the company I represented. I made sure they knew that I was the CEO of Norfolk Southern. And I also made sure that I asked if they were getting everything that they needed from Norfolk Southern. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Schaub. I yield back. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I think Senator Sanders, you're next. Thank Welcome. you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank the panel uh, for being with us today. Um, Mr. Shaw, you indicated in response to a question from the chairman that you quote, I'm committed to doing what's right, end quote. Well, I think all of us are committed to doing what's right but the devil is in the details. Uh, Mr. Shaw, Wall Street, uh, about a decade ago, in order to increase the profits they were earning in the rail industry, uh, implemented a program called Precision Scheduled Railroading. Uh, the result of that is that Norfolk Southern reduced its workforce by almost 40% over six years. Uh, meanwhile, in fact, Wall Street's goal was achieved. Uh, profits soared for uh, Norfolk Southern. You made over $3 billion in profits uh, last year. Uh, I have been told by workers in, who work for your company uh, and other rail companies that they are now being asked to do more work with fewer workers, and that includes safety inspections. So well before this disaster uh, in East Palestine, uh, we have been told about the potential safety hazards. Will you make a commitment right now to the American people that you will lead the industry in ending this disastrous precision scheduled railroading, which has slashed your workforce and made railroading much less safe? Yes or no, will you make that commitment? Senator, I understand your concern, <clears throat> and I share that concern. And if you'll permit, I, I have a couple points on that. I became CEO in May of last year. Ever since that point, Senator, we've been on a hiring spree. The number of employees at Norfolk Southern today is 1,500 more than it was this time last year. Or, I, I, you'll forgive me. I don't mean to be rude. We just don't have a whole lot of time yet. I understand that, but you will not deny what you're trying to do is rebuild from the massive layoffs that took place. My question back to you again. Wall Street, not the industry, imposed this on the industry. Wall Street said we're not making enough money. Cut workers, cut workers, cut workers, even if it endangers safety. My question to you, very simply, sir, will you lead the industry in doing away with precision scheduled railroading? That concept. Senator, in December of last year, I charted a new course in the industry. I said we're going to move away from a near-term focus solely on profits, and that we're going to take a longer-term view that's founded on our engagement with our craft employees who are so critical to our success. We were the first to pivot out of it. All right, well, let me jump in again. I apologize for cutting you off here, but when you talk about your employees, the entire country, I think, was shocked to learn a number of months ago that your employees, rail workers, who work in dangerous, a dangerous job in all kinds of weather, had zero uh, paid sick days. Now, I know that is beginning to change, but I would ask you, given the fact that Norfolk Southern provided $10 billion in stock buybacks recently, can you tell the American people and your employees right now that in order to improve morale in your workforce, 
that you will guarantee at least seven paid sick days to the 15,000 workers you employ. I do know you've made some progress. You increased paid sick days for some of your workers. Will you do what most Americans think is pretty obvious, that when you get sick, you get guaranteed paid sick days? Will you make that commitment right now to your entire workforce? Senator, with our latest agreement with our employees, which included a historic 24% wage increase and access to premium health care benefits, we immediately pivoted to talking to each of our local... I, I do want... I've been deeply involved. I introduced the amendment on the floor. I know the issue. But what I'm asking you right now, you provided paid sick days to some of your employees. I got it. Thank you. Will you now do it what most of America, what we get here in Congress. Our employees get sick, they get paid sick days. Will you make that commitment right now to guarantee paid sick days to all of your workers? That's not a radical demand, it really is not. Will you make that commitment, sir? Senator, I share your focus on our employees. I will commit to continuing to discuss with them important quality of life issues with our local craft colleagues with all due respect, you sound like a politician here, Mr. Shaw. It's not a deal. Paid sick days is not a radical concept in the year 2023. I am not hearing you make that commitment to guarantee that to all of your workers. Clearly, we should have that for every worker in America. I'm not hearing that commitment. Will you make that commitment, sir? Senator, I, I'm committed to continuing to speak to our employees about quality of life issues that are important to them. All right. Well, I'm chairman of the Health Education Labor Committee. We look forward to having that discussion. Uh, one last issue. You talked about Senator, covering... Senator Graham, uh, rather, uh, Senator, um, Senator Graham is waiting to ask it, so uh, Bernie, if you just keep it really brief. All right, last question. Uh, you talked about covering the needs of the people of East Palestine. Does that include paying for their health care needs? all of their health care needs. Senator, we're going to do what's right for the citizens of What's right is to cover their health care needs. Will you do that? Everything is on the table, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank, thanks. Uh, thank you, Senator Sanders. Uh, Senator Graham. Uh, uh, let's just sort of continue what Senator Sanders was talking about. This hearing is designed to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Um, is precision scheduling, what was the phrase that Senator Sanders used, precision scheduling? What is it? Precision scheduling railroad. Okay. Did that have anything to do with this accident directly? Senator, thank you for that question. Um, the NTSB report said the Norfolk Southern crew did everything that they were supposed to do, and I personally thank them for that. Okay. So... Let's get back to what we're here for, is try to solve the problem in front of us. What caused this? Senator, the NTSB report is still ongoing. Um, I'm not waiting to act. It wasn't lack of personnel, right? There was no indication that it was lack of personnel. Or said. that they did anything wrong. The NTSB specifically said there's no indication that the NS crew did anything wrong. Okay, when we find out what happened, let's try to fix it. And we can talk about paid leave, and you know, I think I may have actually voted for Bernie's amendment. I don't, don't quite remember. But I want to focus on the moment we have here. How many times have you been to East Palestine? Senator, I've been there five times. Uh, Ms. Shore, have you been there? Senator Graham, I've spent 11 out of the last 30 days in East Palestine. Okay. Uh, do you think you benefited from having been there and listened to the people? Very much so. What about you, Mr. Shaw? It's, um, yeah, it, it has really helped me. Yeah, it's, it's good. I'm sorry? Yeah, it's good. That's a good yes, answer. Yes, it's, it's, they, they are Would emotional. you be willing to go to pre with President Biden if he chose to go there? Senator, I, I want to. Would you be willing to go with him if he asked you to go? Senator, I, I want to keep the politics. I don't, I'm not qualified. Well, it's not a political question. The question is, if the president asked you to go, would you go with it? I'll go with anybody who yeah. wants to go and help the community of East Yeah, Boston. Ms. Shore, same for you. If I'm asked to go, I certainly will. Yeah, well, so I'm calling on the president to ask both of you and go. 
what's the downside of talking to people about going through a big trauma? I'm not, <clears throat> you know, him going there doesn't <coughs> fix all of the problems, but I think it's a step in the right direction. And I just wish he would go there so we could all work to solve the problem. The more we know, I, maybe I should go there. The bottom line is, uh, would either one of you have a problem um, living there full time, given the condition on the ground? Do you feel it's safe to continue to reside in this town, Mr. Shaw? <coughs> Senator, um, the EPA and the high EPA have very high standards, and I trust their testing. And uh, would you live there, given what you've seen? Yes, sir. Okay. I believe that the air is safe. I believe that the water okay. is safe. There are hundreds of tests. Okay. There are millions of data points. Okay. They all put to the same thing. And okay. I genuinely enjoy okay. my conversations with the folks of East Palestine. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sure they're traumatized, and every time somebody shows up, it's probably good. Ms. Shore, do you agree that it's a safe place to live? Senator Graham, science is EPA's North Star. And we follow the science. And I drink the water there. I drink it every time I go to town. Okay. Because the scientific data shows that it's safe. Okay. As does the air. That's good. Ms. Vogel, uh, you're from Ohio. Would Have you been there? I've been in East Palestine since February 3rd with the exception of five days. Real dedicated effort here. Uh, do you think you've been enriched by these visits? Has it helped yes. you? Yes, Senator. Do you think you've learned more about the problem having talked to these people? Unquestionably. Uh, would you have a problem living there now? I mostly do. You do have a problem living there? I mostly live there. <laughs> okay, Senator. but so you're okay? Yes, sir. Okay. My team and I good. have been there. Okay, good. Well, the so last month. let's do what we can to make sure it's safe to live there. Let's make sure that we help these people. Um, if they have medical needs, let's meet them. And let's find out what happened and try to fix it the best we can. Does that make sense to everybody on this panel? Okay. So whether or not we need to change overtime laws, uh, we'll talk about that. But what I want to do is make sure that this committee understands that if you live there, everybody here believes it's safe to live there. I feel better about that that the railroad uh, company, the people operating the train, are not accused of being at fault. So let's find out what happened and fix it. And again, you have two senators from Ohio. They're putting together a product. I want to help them the best we can. And I'll just uh, end where I began. I think the president would serve himself and the country will to go there. So please go. So Grandma, you could, is that it? Is that it for you, my friend? All right, thank you. All righty. Uh, before I turn to Senator Whitehouse for, uh, for his questions, let me, let me uh, ask unanimous consent to enter into the record various materials detailing Biden's inspirations focus on safety and uh, negligence uh, to the community. We, you know, we've heard, uh, heard uh, allegations that the Biden administration is sacrificing safety. That's simply not consistent with what has happened in East Palestine or the Biden administration's numerous efforts to improve safety both before and since the, uh, the accident. I want to ask unanimous consent to submit for the record the various materials detailing the Environmental Protection Agency's immediate and ongoing response to the accident, as well as a document describing the Department of Transportation's immediate response to the accident, including the pipeline and hazardous materials safety administration activities and a, doc a document showing concrete steps to strengthen rail and hazardous material safety that Senator, uh, Secretary rather, Buttigieg has directed the Department of Transportation take since the derailment and EPA's proposed rule to strengthen hazardous material management and accident prevention under the risk management uh, program. And last but not least, I'd also note that uh, President Biden called the Ohio and Pennsylvania governors in the first 48 hours offering uh, assistance without Mr. objection. Mr. Chairman, so we're, I, while we're in unanimous consent yeah. mode, yeah. may I ask unanimous consent to add to what you've asked uh, two articles, one uh, titled Ohio Train Derailment as a Reminder of Plastics Dangers, another uh, entitled This Deadly Chemical Should Be Banned, and then a trio, a pair of articles related to the contractor that has been hired by Norfolk Southern 
Uh, one entitled, Oil Companies Rely on Controversial Firm to Rebut Colorado Health Study, and another entitled, The Checkered Past of the Contractor Monitoring the Air in East Palestine, and that would be supplemented by a letter from our new colleague, Peter Welch, back in his days as a House member responding to the uh, oil spill, um, expressing concerns about this company, CTEH. If I could add those to your yeah. list of UCs, I'd be helpful. Uh, is, is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered. Uh, next, uh, Senator Whitehouse, I think you are uh, recognized for question. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Shaw, the news is reporting that there's just been a significant derailment in Alabama of one of your trains. I certainly hope that all of your team and the anybody in the vicinity um, is safe and well. Um, you may need to look into that, um, but I wanted to mention that. Um, I'm interested in my questions in the extent to which politics has played a role in this situation. In 2015, the federal government issued a new regulation requiring trains like yours that carry certain dangerous substances to be equipped with electronic brakes. Along with other industry stakeholders, Norfolk Southern stated that the regulation was, quote, not in the public interest. And the industry successfully got the regulation watered down. Just three years later, the Trump administration fully repealed the regulation. And I will ask you a question for the record for your attorneys and staff to uh, reply to uh, about for all communications uh, between your company and your trade association with the Trump administration relative to that repeal. You don't have to respond now. That's just a coming attraction through our QFR process. Um, I also note that since 2002, the rail industry has spent more than $650 million on federal lobbying, uh, with another $60 million spent on state lobbying. The five largest spenders were the Association of American Railroads, a, your major trade group, uh, BNSF Railway, CSX Corporation, Union Pacific Corporation, and you can answer for me who was the fifth big spender. I'll give you a hint. It's Norfolk Southern. Uh, do you know how much it was that Norfolk Southern spent on lobbying during that period? No, sorry, I don't. Okay. For the record, $69 million. Um, Norfolk Southern lobbies through the National Association of Manufacturers as well. Do you, by any chance, know how much Norfolk Southern gave to National Association of Manufacturers in 2016 and 2017 when it was opposing the breaking regulations I mentioned? Senator, I will note that the NTSB, Chair Hamadi, specifically stated that the breaking regulation that you referenced would not have had an impact on this derailment. Okay, and will you answer my question? Do you know how much you spent against that regulation? No, sir, I don't. I also know that the government's own GAO and the National Academies of Science indicated in 2016 that the Department of Transportation's, or the, pardon me, the FRA's review of ECP breaks was unjustified. Um, I will ask you a question for the record that the information for 2016 and 2017 that you have reported for later years in your climate lobbying report uh, be provided uh, to the committee, an equivalent to what you already provide, but looking back to those years when this was at, at issue. Um, we discovered that Norfolk Southern, in a statement that appears now to have been deleted from your website, had previously touted the ECP braking systems as having, and I quote you here, the potential to reduce train stopping distances by as much as 60% over conventional air brake systems. And we found as early as 2007 a Norfolk Southern lead engineer promoting the, quote, big advantage for emergency braking that ECP brakes offered. So I want to uh, make those statements a part uh, of the record. And is it true that um, the New York Times reporting that Norfolk Southern has paid shareholders nearly $18 billion through stock buybacks and dividends in 2022. The New York Times is reporting what, sir? That Norfolk Southern paid its shareholders nearly $18 billion through stock buybacks and dividends in 2022. 
Sir, I have a different perspective on that. Or is the number right? No, sir. Setting aside your perspective? No, sir. Okay. Uh, then let me add to my QFR list your view of what the accurate number is as opposed to the New York Times number. All right. Uh, my time is pretty well up, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I hope we can get prompt and complete answers to those QFRs. Thanks very much. All right. Uh, we look forward to your responses on QFRs, questions for the record, and we'll talk more about that before we conclude. Thank you. Um, I think next is uh, Senator Merkley and then Senator Markey, not to be confused with one another. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for bringing your testimony uh, to, to bear. And I do hope that the uh, derailment that occurred just hours ago, uh, Mr. Shaw, is, uh, is, is one that does not endanger another community. Uh, back in 2016, Senator Wyden and I were very involved in pushing for improvements in safety after the derailment endangered the town of Mosier in, in Oregon. And we, we found out how much the industry resists uh, improvements in, in safety. That following year, Norfolk Southern uh, was invited to participate in a, a conversation with the administration. And they submitted a 23-page submission of rules and federal guidance of things that they wanted safety regulations to be removed. Now, You've noted you're turning over a new leaf in this regard. So can we count on you and your team of, of lobbyists to push for safety improvements rather than lobbying against those improvements? Yes, Senator, I, I share your concern and your focus. I don't share my concern. I just want to know, will your team lobby for safety improvements rather than against them? Senator, we will continue to follow science. We will continue to follow data. There are actually a number of areas in which we have invested in safety, system, safety systems well above government regulation. I'll, I'll ask you to submit that for the record. I, I just really thought when you said turn over new leaf that I thought you were saying you were going to now support safety regulations. I'm sorry you can't tell this crowd here today that would like to hear that, that that is the, the, the case. Um, Three years ago, Norfolk Southern cut five positions in East Palestine that oversaw maintenance of equipment detectors that are used to de determine uh, or monitor boxes that measure, sometimes they're called hot boxes, that measure things that are going wrong on the track, including bearing temperature. There's initial reports that defective bearings or overheating bearings may well have been the cause of this particular accident. Will you pledge today to quit eliminating positions and sensors that oversee track conditions, like, like removing the folks who monitor the hot boxes, and instead add and support those monitors so that when there is something like an overheating bearing, it gets detected and the train gets stopped rather than crashing or derailing? Senator, the NTSB report indicated that all of the hot box detectors were working as designed. And earlier this week, we announced that we are adding approximately 200 hot box detectors to our network. We already have amongst the lowest spacing between hot box detectors in the industry, and we already have amongst the lowest thresholds. I'm, I'm delighted to hear that you're, you're adding those back. Thank you. It's also important to recognize those boxes actually have to be monitored, and it's the five positions for monitoring them that were eliminated. So I hope in response to the, the committee, you'll also be able to, to note how those are being monitored and how that monitoring can be in, improved. Uh, my my uh, last question here uh, is that um, in 2021, uh, your company did $3.1 billion of stock buybacks, and in 2022, $3.4 billion of stock buybacks. And as of December, had another $7.5 billion available to do additional stock backs under the $10 billion stock back plan. Uh, that's quite impressive numbers for any American uh, company. It indicates uh, massive uh, profits. Will you pledge today that you will do no more stock buybacks until a raft of safety measures have been completed to reduce the risk of derailments and crashes in the future? Senator, I will commit to invest in continuing to invest in safety. We invest over a billion dollars a year 
And you, you noted that you have a list of safety things you'd like to implement. Will you commit no more stock buybacks until those safety improvements are completed? Senator, I will commit to continuing to invest in safety. And you've seen over time the number of derailments, hazardous material releases, and personal injuries has declined. There's always more that we will do, and I am committed to having the best safety culture in the industry. You're coming here with three derailments within three months, and the average in the industry is one per month for the entire industry. Uh, so congratulations on maybe some good luck over a few years. But at this moment, uh, your team is, is the team that has the most derailments in the last three months. Uh, I just want to uh, note uh, that the, every engineer understands that if you have brakes on every car rather than just brakes on the front car, uh, that you prevent the accordion-style crashes that you've been, been having. It's, it's why any truck carrying a trailer has brakes on the trailer instead so the trailer doesn't flip over the top of it. The industry has absolutely resisted these, uh, trying to deploy their, their lobbyists to counter every single report about having those multiple brake systems. I understand that it's complicated because, as you noted, you don't own the cars. That makes, that makes having these coordinated brake systems. But listen, if we can put people on the moon, we can put brakes on every train car. Uh, this is really the single most significant safety factor that could be pursued, and I really hope that you and your company and your industry will take and start taking seriously safety, which we have not seen to this point. Senator, I take safety very seriously, and there are brakes on every car. I can assure you of that. Well, I hope you support the coordinated pneumatic electronically controlled system that you've been fighting against uh, for years. S Senator Markey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, the East Palestine train derailment was not preordained. It was preventable. It was a disaster waiting to happen. Corporate greed, outdated railway safety regulations, lax hazardous material standards were all the fuel on a toxic fire that was ready to combust. This was something that was preordained and known about because of all of the rail accidents that happened every year in our country. And unfortunately, innocent, hardworking, working families in Ohio and Pennsylvania were the ones that got harmed by this. Uh, those families were upended, their lives have been changed, doctor bills, veterinarian bills, saw the values of their homes plummet overnight and stayed up late worrying about what this means for their health and the health of their young children in the future. These are real harms. So am I right, Mr. Shaw, that last year the stock buybacks by Norfolk Southern was $3.4 billion, is that correct? Yes, sir, that's directionally correct. Am I correct, Mr. Shaw, that last year Norfolk Southern made $3.3 billion in profits? Yes, sir. And last year we invested over a billion dollars in safety. And last year our accident rate, our, our number of accidents was the lowest it had been in the last 10 years. Our safety stats, Senator, continue to improve. And I am committed to making Norfolk Southern safety culture the best in the industry. Well, you're yes. not having a good month. You're not having a good month. And it seems like every week there's another accident that Norfolk Southern uh, is a part of in our country. So you may think that you've put in enough, okay? But the facts are saying just the opposite in terms of what is happening. And what I'm hearing from you is just this great confidence that you have in your system. But I'll tell you this, Mr. Shaw. Overconfidence breeds complacency, and complacency breeds disaster. And that disaster has hit East Palestine and it's hitting community after community across this country, not just Norfolk Southern, but the 
rail industry in general that has reduced its workforce by one third over the last 10 years. And in that reduction in workforce, there is a reduction in the measure of safety that has to be built in in order to guarantee that people avoid these kinds of catastrophes. So let me ask you, um, Mr. Shaw, about a decision that your company has made. You, you've chosen an arbitrary one mile radius from the disaster site for people to qualify for assistance, meaning some families who breathe the same air, drink the same water, aren't getting the same help. Mr. Shaw, will you commit to providing financial compensation to all affected people, including those who live outside your arbitrarily chosen one mile radius around the derailment site? Senator, we've made our Family Assistance Center and payments available to folks within the zip code, within Darlington Township, We've committed to Will you commit to helping those people outside of the one mile radius? That's my question. Yes or no? Senator, we already are. You already are? Yes, sir. All right. Well, that's not uh, clear. Uh, okay. uh, will you commit to compensating effective homeowners for their diminished property values? Senator, sen pardon me. Senator, I'm committing to do what's right. Well, what's right is a family that had a home worth $100,000 that is now worth $50,000 will probably never be able to sell that home for $100,000 again. Will you compensate that family for that loss? Okay. Senator, I'm committed to do what's right. That is term. the right thing to do. These are the people who are innocent victims, Mr. Shaw. These people were just there at home and all of a sudden, their small businesses, their homes are forever going to have been diminished in value. Norfolk Southern owes these people. It's an accident that is basically under the responsibility of Norfolk Southern, not these families. When you say do the right thing, will you again compensate these families for their diminished, lost, property value for homes and small businesses. Senator, we've already committed $21 million, and that's a down payment. That is a down payment. Will you commit to ensuring that these families, these innocent families, do not lose their life savings in their homes and small businesses? The right thing to do is to say, yes, we will. Senator, I'm committed to doing what's right for the community, and we're going to be there as no, long what, as No, what's right for the community will then be balanced, which is what we can see from your stock buybacks, by what's right for Norfolk Southern. And that's going to be to sue, to fight, to resist full compensation for these families. That's the pattern we've seen over the last 10 years in your one-third reduction in workforce with its natural um, concomitant redu reduction already... in safety. Okay, then uh, go to you right now. Uh, we're not hearing the right things today. These families want to know long term, are they just going to be left behind? Once this, once the cameras move on, once uh, the, the, the national attention uh, dies down, you know, where will these families be? I think they're going to be in the crosshairs of the accountants of Norfolk Southern saying, we're not going to pay full compensation. That's why we're going to stay on this case until everyone in East Palestine is given the justice which they deserve. Uh, we have Senator Padilla who is up next. Just by way of explanation, uh, we're in the middle of two votes, so that's why we're sort of ping-ponging a little bit. Sorry for the disruptions. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I understand while I uh, stepped away for the votes you just referenced, uh, there's been additional uh, questions uh, about the uh, stock buybacks, uh, which I may have some follow-up on, as well as uh, 
follow to the uh, precision scheduled railroading that I know Senator Sanders, Senator uh, Graham, among others, have raised. But let me actually uh, uh, ask a question of uh, uh, Ms. Shore. Let me just find my place here. Uh, in the spirit of holding polluters accountable. So we know what brings us here today is the uh, incidents, plural now, in East Palestine. But um, I think we can all agree that we need to hold polluters accountable. Uh, and I have strong feelings about this personally, having dealt with uh, the fallout of the federal government failing to hold uh, companies accountable for environmental crimes and leaving communities holding the bag. Uh, so aside from the loosening of regulations, which we need to discuss and debate uh, part of the conversation for the uh, rail incident in East Palestine, I uh, want to bring attention to uh, a case in my hometown of Los Angeles. Uh, under the Trump administration, the EPA, your predecessors, the agency you, you're part of leading, along with the Department of Justice under the Trump administration, supported a bankruptcy plan that let the corporate polluter known as Exide evade criminal liability and responsibility to clean up decades of toxic dumping. And as a result, left California taxpayers on the hook for the largest environmental cleanup in our state's history. So my question uh, Ms. Shore, is how will the EPA ensure that what happened during the Trump administration, uh, what they inflicted on the Los Angeles communities surrounding the Exide plant isn't repeated in East Palestine? Thank you, Senator Padilla. On February 21st, EPA issued a unilateral administrative order. It's one of the most powerful enforcement tools that the agency has under the CERCLA, the Comprehensive Environmental Recovery Compensation and Liability Act that will hold Norfolk Southern accountable to pay for all the costs of the cleanup and restoration in East Palestine. If the company doesn't comply with EPA's uh, order, then EPA can step in, continue the work so there's no disruption in the essential cleanup, and assess three times the costs as penalties. It's a tool that EPA has used effectively in the past, and we will be vigorous about holding the company accountable. The, um, okay, thank you, because uh, uh, again, we saw what I would consider a worse case study, not a best case study, when these uh, settlements uh, completely uh, leave polluters uh, off the hook for the damage uh, that they've taken. I know that was a prior administration. Policies have changed under the current administration. Uh, we're working to uh, uh, embed that environmental justice lens as well, uh, not just at EPA, but within the Department of Justice and hope to make it uh, uh, permanent. I uh, <clears throat> want to uh, come back to uh, Mr. Shaw here for a few questions on, uh, as it pertains to uh, the, your workforce, uh, inspections uh, and maintenance. Um, you recently announced the, uh, that North Folk Southern would be deploying more wayside detection and hop box detector technology as part of the safety plan. Uh, and I apologize if this is a little bit redundant with the questions that have come up prior in the hearing, but I think I have some specifics I want to get to. Uh, from what I understand, uh, the company has also reduced its workforce by nearly 40% since 2015. According to your own data reported to the Surface Transportation Board, the number of employees assigned to maintenance of equipment and stores has decreased by 60% over the past decade, your data. Given what's happened, is Norfolk Southern now going to hire the additional signal workers necessary to maintain and inspect the system that you're relying on to improve safety? Yes, Senator, thank you for that question. Uh, the NTSB report was very clear that our hot box detectors were working 
as designed, we have taken it upon ourselves to install more hot box detectors as needed. Senator, I became CEO of Norfolk Southern 10 months ago. And Senator, ever since then, we've been on a hiring spree. We are aggressively hiring employees. Right now, our pipeline of conductor trainees is amongst the highest on, in, in our history. And I'm not going to stop. So let me be specific. You're, you, you say you're on a hiring spree. I want to be specific to the signal workers necessary to maintain and inspect the systems. Senator, if we need to hire more signal workers to maintain and inspect this, the signals, we will absolutely do. Let me ask you this question. Um, and I don't know if you've worked the line or at least walked the line, but how many sensors or length of track are assigned to each worker? Senator, I don't have that specific information. You know if workers are specifically dedicated to the inspection and maintenance of these technologies or if it's just one on a long list of responsibilities they may have in the course of a day? Senator, I don't know the specifics to that. I'm, I'm happy to get that information to you. Well, let me tell you why I ask. According to the AFL-CIO's Transportation Trades Department, the amount of time car men have to inspect each car in a train has been reduced by two-thirds from three minutes to now just 60 seconds per car. 60 seconds. Do you know how long it takes to walk the perimeter of a single car? You think 60 seconds is enough to not just walk the perimeter of that train car, but does that leave enough time for an actual thorough inspection? Because I can imagine that uh, this gives us the confidence that carmen have the time to conduct that thorough inspection to identify or find any potential defects before the cars are sent back into service. Uh, so I know initial reviews and studies uh, uh, have, have said the sensors were or weren't working, as, as you mentioned, but the investigation is not complete. Right, NTSB is still doing some follow-up work. So uh, sorry to drill down on a specific, but these specifics matter. And it's not just the technologies, it's the workforce necessary to install, to maintain, and to ensure that they're properly functioning. And to me, it just falls into the greater pattern that we've seen for, of the past decade. Workforce overall reducing. Uh, corporate compensations to stock buybacks on the upswing when uh, the workforce that keeps the trains running and running safe is what's being compromised. I know my time is up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Sabatow. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you to everyone for being here. This is obviously incredibly serious. Um, and um, Mr. Shaw, Norfolk Southern's lack of transparent communication with impacted states, I'm specifically thinking of Michigan now, during the cleanup process concerns me. Uh, do you think it was acceptable that the company started moving toxic waste from East Palestine to Michigan without notifying Michigan officials? Michigan officials were not notified. Senator, working with the EPA, uh, we were taking product to facilities that were specifically designed to handle this type of material. But Michigan officials, the governor, myself, Senator Peters, Michigan EPA, and so were not notified before that happened. And so let me just say that I'm, that's why I'm really glad the EPA is now overseeing this process going forward, because um, that's not acceptable to us in Michigan. And so uh, Administrator Shore, moving forward, can I count on you and the EPA to work with us? during the cleanup process so we can make sure Michigan families aren't put in danger? Senator Stabenow, you certainly can. The administrative order that we issued that went into effect fully on February 27th requires Norfolk Southern to notify our co-regulators, in your case, the Michigan Eagle, of shipments to the state. But as they continue to ship waste, EPA will take the additional step of keeping you and congressional staff in the state informed. Thank you so much, because that did not happen at the beginning. And so I appreciate now 
with EPA oversight that this will be happening because it was very concerning to people in Michigan and as well as elected officials. Um, I have a quote from Norfolk Southern. We are going to learn from this terrible accident and work with regulators and elected officials to improve railroad safety. Mr. Shaw, we certainly need to do that. We certainly need to strengthen safety standards, especially now that we have an administration that supports strong standards instead of working to gut them like the last administration did. So we're now in a good spot to be able to move forward. We have bipartisan legislation to do that. But here's my question. Um, when you tell us the company is ready to learn from this, I'd feel better if this wasn't the 20th time since 2015 that the company has had a derailment result in a chemical release, and it's my understanding that the 21st incident almost happened in Van Buren Township in Michigan just two weeks after East Palestine. So my question is, great that you're saying you're going to learn from number 20. What did you learn from number 19? What did you learn from number one or number five or number 10 or number 15? Um, what safety measures have you implemented since this was the 20th time since 2015 that there had been a derailment resulting in a chemical release? Senator, I think that's the right thing to focus on, and I'm focused on it too. We invest over a billion dollars a year in safety, and you've seen over time the number of derailments and hazardous material releases and personal injuries decline. We will continue to get better, and I'm committed to creating the best safety culture in the industry. Just this week, we announced several new initiatives to enhance safety, which included more hot box detectors across our network, partnering with other railroads to share best practices on hot box detector technology. We, we are also putting up a machine visioning portal that can catch things that the human eye can't, developed in partnership with Georgia Tech. There are a number of different areas in which we are investing in safety. I'm, I am very confident in the NTSB process, which is focused on, right now, a, a wheel bearing that failed and noted that the Norfolk Southern crew and the hot box detectors and the track were all operating as as appropriate. I'm not waiting for the full response, and you're seeing action right now. I appreciate that. I think it's probably hard for families and businesses in East Palestine to hear this, though, when if that had been done in response to number 18 in the derailments, or number 15, or number 4, or, or any of those, we wouldn't have had number 20 which is what's happening to the community right now. And my heart goes out to them and what they're having to deal with. And frankly, having had these similar, different but similar situations with toxic substance in Michigan and so on, this is gonna take a long time for them to be able to recover. And so this is number 20. I don't want number 21 in Michigan or any place else for that matter. And we talked a lot about the, the investments that you elect looking at and making in the community, which, uh, which you need to do legally, morally, ethically, in every which way. But I hope, also hope that you're looking at uh, taking another look at stock buybacks of the future. I know you've done six and a half billion already in the last two years, and there was 7.5 billion supposedly coming up. Um, it'd be a better use of that of that money if, in fact, you were investing in aggressive, responsible safety measures and making this community and any other community whole. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Stabenow. I've uh, got a couple of questions, and then uh, Senator uh, Capito is going to ask some questions, and then we'll probably go to, uh, to a closing statement. But uh, last. Uh, Last uh, August, EPA proposed, this would be a question, I think, for Administrator Shaw and for Mr. Shaw, for, bo for both of you. 
But last August, the EPA proposed to amend its, its regulations for the, uh, the risk management program, as you probably know, which is an important uh, program to help businesses avoid and address uh, hazardous chemical accidents. Uh, EPA's proposed changes would improve the accident prevention program, uh, enhance um, emergency preparedness, and increase public uh, uh, availability of chemical hazard information. The goals of these changes is to improve public awareness, uh, and to improve preparedness, and to improve safety. However, the Association of American Railroads, I'm told, of which Norfolk Southern is a, a member, uh, submitted com comments to EPA expressing concern about the proposed changes. Those comments assert that the safety requirements that EPA proposed would, this is a quote, have limited use, close quote. And uh, let me just ask uh, Administrator Shaw, can, can you explain how the risk management program and EPA's recent proposed uh, changes will help protect the health and safety of first responders and the local community? And then I'll turn to Mr. Shaw. But Ms. Shore. Oh, sure. Yeah, Administrator Shore, can you explain how the risk management program and EPA's recent proposed changes will help protect the health and safety of first responders and the local community? Thank you, Chairman Carper. Uh, certainly accident prevention is a top priority at EPA. The risk management program rule has been successful in reducing the frequency of accidental releases at regulated facilities. But as I understand it, it doesn't pertain to rail transport. So there's work that we can, can do there to try to protect first responders who are responding to derailments and releases resulting from rail accidents. Okay. Uh, Mr. Shaw, uh, does Norfolk Southern oppose EPA's proposed changes to the risk management program to enhance our preparedness for chemical accidents? Senator, um, I apologize. I'm not familiar with that program. I'm happy to review the legislation or the program and discuss it with you further. I have a sincere appreciation for the first responders from Ohio and Pennsylvania, um, some of whom are joining me on this panel in West Virginia who, who ran to the scene. Um, as a result, we just announced yesterday a regional first responder training center that will support the first responders of Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. And every year, we train approximately 5,000 first responders. And so we are committed. Is that in the them. states in which you operate? Yes, sir. No. Okay. All right. Um, last uh, question. This is really a question for all of you. And I'll, Mr. Burrell, I'll start with you. And, uh, but the question's for all, all witnesses. Uh, my uh, colleagues, including uh, certainly a ranking member, have heard me uh, say that in adversity lies op opportunity. That's uh, Einstein, pretty smart guy. Most people remember Einstein for saying uh, the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. That might be pertinent here today as well. But I always believe that in adversity lies opportunity. And uh, that's the way I approach life. And I think it's the way a lot of us approach life. But the um, uh, this en environmental tragedy creates uh, not just tragedy and heartbreak, uh, real heartache for a whole lot of people, but it uh, but also creates some uh, opportunity for us to uh, to examine not only what went wrong in the uh, on the heels of uh, this uh, derailment, but also to look at, at some of the moments where things went right, where things went right, and uh, I'm going to ask each of you, and, and uh, Mr. Brad, I just want to start with you. Uh, to just very briefly speak to something you believe has, uh, has gone well. And uh, while working together across many entities to navigate the response to this environmental disaster. Can you give us an example or two of what you thought went particularly well? Sure, I think uh, you know, relationships we have with everyone up here, the other responders, um, was positive. Um, you know, initially, we had good relationships, good communications with the, on, as I said, the boots on the ground. Um, it, it may not be that way whenever the, the boss has gone on scene, and I said that. But, um, and as Mr. Shaw said, training, um, you know, collaborative training from the railroads uh, is something that positive will come out of this, I think. 
All right, good. Mr. Harrison, same same question. I think uh, share with us something you think has gone uh, uh, well and, and needs to be uh, uh, lifted up. Go ahead. For Sanko, the success of, of our partnership uh, investment in, in planning, uh, building the organic detection system, training our staff, uh, this was not a uh, unique response. Uh, we, we get several hundred reports of uh, potential spills a year from the National Response Center. So we have been doing this for, for decades. And so having the, the ability to put that uh, in place, I think, has been very positive and also just to demonstrate uh, how our, our team and our system and our partnership works. All right, thanks. Uh, Ms. Vogel, same question, please. Chairman, the mayor of East Palestine and the fire chief have really done such an exceptional job representing their community, protecting their community, connecting their community with people who can provide scientific answers. They've done such an incredible job refuting misinformation that's out there that uh, we're you know, getting people connected with uh, the scientists either at Ohio EPA or US EPA. And I, I do think that's an example of something that has gone very well. All right, good, thank you. Um, sure. Chairman Carper, I think what has been remarkable, though it should be standard, about the response to this disaster in East Palestine is the way local, state, federal agencies have worked collaboratively together that it's not been about politics but about people. You've seen Democrats standing with Republicans. President Biden was on the phone to Governor DeWine saying, whatever federal resources are needed, they will be there for you. He did the same with Governor Shapiro of Pennsylvania. You saw Administrator Regan standing to announce the order with Governor DeWine and Governor Shapiro, with Congressman Bill Johnson and Congressman DeLucio, and so many others. I think that collaboration focused on getting this cleaned up has been quite remarkable. Yeah, good. Thanks uh, to, for those. Um, Mr. Shaw, same question, please. Thank you for the question, Senator. Um, I've been really clear that I'm focused on the environmental cleanup and helping East Palestine thrive. The things that have gone really well have been the coordination and the collaboration that we've received from the folks at this table. And I've made a personal commitment to Secretary Buttigieg and Governor DeWine and Mayor Conaway and Fire Chief Drabeck and Governor Shapiro and Administrator Regan that we're going to do everything it takes. I, I generally I have a genuine affection for the folks of East Palestine, which I know several of my peers on this panel do as well. And when you walk around town, you're starting to see these yard signs pop up. And the yard signs say, we are East Palestine. And it goes on to say, welcome to America's greatest comeback story. And Senator, I want to make sure that that happens. Yeah. We have a great opportunity here. If, if we can collaborate and work together uh, to uh, uh, lift, not just to lift up, not just to address the immediate problems and crisis, but actually to empower the people of East Palestine and, and, and the communities around them, to empower them. And I think that's a good thing that can come out of this. Senator Capito, thanks so much for your work on this. Thanks. Thank you. And I think it's uh, in my opening statement, I said we need to find out what went right and what went wrong. So I really appreciate the, the, the comments of what went right. I'm going to go back to the other side. I'm still very disturbed about the, co the communication issue because We've seen it already in the panel. Uh, Ms. Vogel said initially there were some, uh, you, you had the need to refute poor information and that there were some communication gaps. Mr. Brewer has said that th there were some communication gaps at least as far as one car to five cars and maybe some other things. And I understand in, this, in the haze of what was going on at the very beginning, some of that is going to occur. Senator Stabenow said she doesn't, she didn't know, her governor didn't know that cars were being brought to Michigan carrying hazardous materials. And it seemed as though, even though the EPA has to okay where Mr. Shaw and Norfolk Southern takes this materials, it was a little passing, who, who's, who's supposed to do it? I mean, 
uh, Ms. Shore said that uh, Mr. Shaw is supposed to, it seemed to me it would be a shared responsibility, but you know, we can't get it. It's all I'm getting back to is if you're sitting there in East Palestine or in, in uh, Beaver County, Pennsylvania, you're seeing this huge pile of hazardous materials and you're smelling it. And, and, and the reason I'm coming from this has been a front of community of Charleston, West Virginia that had a chemical spill in the early 2000s that everybody told us was safe to drink, but it still smelled. And you just lose your trust in, in what people are telling you. And this is what the neighborhoods and the surrounding areas are doing. So then when I asked the question, where is this material going? Both uh, Ms. Shore and Mr. Shaw said, it's going somewhere, but we don't know where. What does that do to trust? I mean, I, I don't know. Are the trucks moving or not? Uh, were they stopped in Michigan or not? Why were they stopped in Michigan? You know, all these questions, I think, just, and then the people living there still have to look and smell and fear. And, and so I think we just need to get our uh, the transparency of where this material is going, how long it's going to take it to get out, how deep does it have to go, all these questions that people are asking, because they want this over. And that's what you're trying to do, trying to get it over and, and make it safe. So as we go to lessons learned on the communication, I would just hope that we, in the after report that we know is going to be generated, that this is really a key part of what everybody looks at. Uh, from all the different uh, respondents, both from Norfolk Southern all the way to the people right there. Do you know what's burning? Do you have the right equipment? Do you have the right fire fighting uh, equipment? Because chemical fires are different than other kinds of fires. I don't need to tell you your business, but you know all that. And so uh, I'm, I'm still very concerned about uh, the, the communication aspects. And I know uh, Governor De uh, DeWine has been right there front and center, and I want to thank him for that, and you all too. So that, that's my comment there. Um, my question is from uh, Mr. Harrison at Orsenko. And the reason I'm interested in this is because that Ohio River feeds a lot of our water systems in West Virginia. So what's coming down through there and through uh, is so critically important. Osanko does a great job. I know you did multiple testings, but why, why were you uniquely positioned to respond as well as you did? Your information was coming out quickly. Your tests were coming out quickly. My understanding is your tests and Ohio tests were coming out much more quickly than the EPA's test. Is, that, is there truth to that? And why can you come and respond as quickly as this? We need your microphone. In Orsenko, uh, I appreciate that. We have been working to protect the Ohio River as a uh, drinking water, industrial water supply for 75 years. And so through our uh, preparations, I, I have a great team of 22 professionals uh, and our partnerships. Um, we've been doing this for, for decades. And so as we, we work with the drinking water utilities, uh, we have a partner, Greater Sensei Waterworks, that uh, ran companion testing with us, so we had um, results that we could put on our website uh, that went through proper QAQC uh, very quickly. We had the encouragement uh, of, of Governor DeWine and Director Vogel to, to get that up there as soon as possible, and so we've been doing that. We've been able to show a map of where the sampling is occurring, and we've been able to update that as we get new results from Greater Cincinnati Waterworks. And then we also have our screening data. So this is something that we, we prepare for. We work closely with our 30 drinking water utilities, uh, our state agencies. And so the, although this is certainly a challenge, uh, we, we uh, respond and, and work through numerous spills. And so this is through preparation. Does anybody want to comment on my communication tirade I just had? Is there a, a ways to improve that? Or uh, am I over-exaggerating? I'm just looking at it from the eyes of a homeowner sitting in East Palestine, seeing this mess in front of them and trying to figure out when, when, can, my, uh, uh, when can I make sure that uh, I can bathe my child in the water and feel that it's 100% safe. So does, do you all have any suggestions here on how to make communications better, quicker, faster, more accurate? Because if you leave a gap, you see what happens in the gap. Ms. Vogel, did you have a suggestion? Senator, I can comment on one thing that Governor DeWine began doing about two weeks ago is putting out a daily inf uh, um, mm -hmm. an email and posting on the website a press release. It goes out daily that contains all of the facts that you're talking about mm -hmm. to say where exactly the waste is going, how much is going off-site, what uh, sampling data is back, what test results are back. 
exactly to your point, to make sure that we are providing good information on a daily basis. Anybody, Mr. Shaw? Yeah, Senator, similarly, uh, we set up a website, nsmakingitright.com, which has very similar information. It also has updates on how to get in touch with us, how to reach the Family Assistance Center. It points folks to the EPA website and testing data, the Ohio EPA um, testing data, and I'm asking for input from the citizens of East Palestine every day on how to make that website better. Anybody else? All right, thank you all. Oh, uh, Ms. Shore, uh, Director Shore. Ranking Member Capito, I just want to add that uh, under the order, Norfolk Southern submitted a very comprehensive work plan to the Unified Command late Monday evening. It's being reviewed, and I've asked our team on the ground to issue weekly notices of here's the work plan for the week. Here's what you can expect to be done as residents. Here's what you may be seeing or hearing or smelling. Here's who to call if you have questions. And going forward, we will have that weekly work plan available so residents in the community know what to expect. So I guess what I'm gleaning from this, and, I'll, and then I'll stop, uh, Mr. Chair, is uh, maybe, the, maybe these daily progressions of what's going on, you know, try to start as close to day one as possible so you, you, you don't have these gaps in communications and misunderstandings and, and all of that. But I appreciate all of you coming. Uh, thank you for what you're doing for the great citizens of Ohio and Pennsylvania, and we're right in there, right in between. So uh, we appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, let me just say, uh, Senator Capito, I, how much I appreciate uh, your work on this. I want to uh, th thank your staff. Uh, this has been very much a team effort, and I want to thank uh, the majority staff uh, as, as well. One is sitting to my right, the other is sitting to my, my left, but they're really uh, really a team, and uh, I'm proud of, uh, of that teamwork, and uh, we're, uh, we're stronger together. Um, I, um, I, I just I, I want to ask a question, if I can, Mr. Mr. Shaw, if I can. My staff just handed me uh, some information about a Norfolk Southern train uh, that we heard about just a, a little bit ago today, de derailed in Calhoun County, Alabama. There are 30 train cars on the train. All were empty. Fortunately, the local sheriff was reported there are no injuries, there are no pro property damage. And that, so that's uh, a good news, bad news story. But uh, I, I, used, I spent a lot of my life in the Navy and airplanes and thought a lot about safety. And my wife worked for DuPont for many uh, years, and she was very much involved as a safety company, as you may know. She's thought a great deal uh, about safety. When, when you look, and I might have this wrong, but we had the, uh, the, uh, the disaster in East Palestine, uh, Palestine around February 3rd. We had uh, Springfield, Ohio, uh, 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 beginning of, um, of uh, this month. Cleveland, Ohio, where one of your employees' uh, lives was, was lost. And now the, uh, the incident in Calhoun County. I understand the National uh, Transportation Safety Board is, is uh, going to be examining the safety culture of Norfolk Southern, and, and you probably welcome that. And if I were in your shoes, I would. But it's, uh, it's uh, more than disconcerting. It's concerning. And uh, it's uh, a, a trend that uh, is troubling to me, and my guess is troubling to you as well. So I hope that uh, we'll get the kind of serious attention that it, uh, that it needs. Um, when uh, we're, I was walking into the the hearing, uh, I was asked by the press. I'm sure as Senator Capito was, is what we uh, hope to accomplish here. And and I mentioned uh, I, I had several questions that I wanted to see answers. One of those: What went wrong? How did this all happen uh, at uh, East Palestine? How, how did it happen? Uh, what went wrong? What are we doing to help the families whose lives have been upended, and uh, and and uh, in, in any number of ways? And uh, the other question that, uh, that I, I, I mentioned coming into the, to the hearing was, how can we reduce the, the likelihood that similar, similar disasters uh, like this uh, will uh, happen uh, again in Ohio or Pennsylvania or Delaware or West Virginia? How, do we, how can we uh, reduce that? I, uh, I've said forever, everything I do, I know I can do better. Everything I do, I know I can do better. I think that's true of all of us. And it's a good, if you actually go back to the Constitution of our country, and the preamble of the Constitution says, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union. It doesn't say to form a perfect union. It says a more perfect union. And the, uh, the expectation all those years ago and, and still today is for us to, uh, to, to do better as we, we, uh, we go uh, forward. Um, I, uh, 
I have a printed statement here. I'm going to read this as well and then close off, which is one more uh, comment from uh, straight from straight from my heart. But uh, in closing, um, I want to thank uh, our witnesses for your time uh, and uh, uh, testimony today. I want to thank our uh, colleagues who came and testified before uh, us today and those that are working in a bipartisan way on legislation to help address uh, these concerns. I especially want to thank a ranking member for what has truly been a, a bipartisan bipartisan hearing. Uh, people, if, I think if folks, people around the country who thinks we, we never work together here, we don't accomplish any, uh, you know, uh, cooperate on anything, uh, they'd be they'd be uh, pleasantly surprised if they could be in this room with us most of the, most of the year. It's, this, that's that's the way we we work together and we get a lot done. But today's hearing uh, provided some much needed answers for the American people. We've learned more about uh, what happened the days and weeks after the Norfolk uh, Southern uh, train derailment and subsequent uh, release of, of chemicals. We also learned uh, that EPA and its state partners were on the ground with, uh, within hours and, and still there today. We've heard from uh, local officials that North Norfolk Southern uh, poorly communicated uh, with them initially and, and that uh, created mistrust in the community, at least initially. And, the other thing, one of the things I'm concerned about, I'm, I'm not a big fan, I said, Mr. Shaw, uh, yes, no answers. That's, that's not usually my style. But uh, I, I didn't think we heard as many uh, unequivocal answers, yeses, as I might like to have. And we might want to uh, th you know, revisit that uh, at another time. Uh, this doesn't, has, it doesn't help to alleviate uh, the community's mistrust, but I'm uh, relieved to hear the testimony regarding the safety of air and water and the attentiveness of federal, state, and and local responders. And I hope the community feels that they've uh, gotten some answers uh, today. And, and I'll say this again, we stand with the people, we stand with the people of, of East uh, Palestine and surrounding communities. And I commit, and I know I speak for this, uh, Senator Capito, I commit to, uh, to hold uh, uh, Norfolk Southern Street to the fire to make sure that this community is is made uh, made whole. There's. Uh, uh, clearly a lot more to discuss on with respect to safety for rail and hazardous uh, materials and I expect the Commerce Committee will pursue these questions in the next uh, few days in their own hearing on this uh, topic. I think it was Bill Gates who once said it's uh, fine to uh, celebrate success but it's more important to heed the lessons of failure. Think about that. It's fine to celebrate this success but it's also important to hear, uh, heed the, uh, the lessons of failure. And um, in this circumstance, I believe we must heed the lessons we learned today about this disaster. American lives and livelihood depend on that. If we're smart and if we'll put our differences aside and, and work together to support the impact of communities in collaboration and collaborate on policies that will ensure uh, an accident like this doesn't happen again. Um, I. Um, before we, uh, we address, I, I need to do a little bit of housekeeping. I just ask unanimous consent to submit into the record some materials related to today's hearing, include the letter from the governor of Pennsylvania who I talked with over the weekend. And uh, I referenced that, that uh, in uh, that uh, letter and earlier, but articles and also independent analyses related to the, the accident. Senators are gonna be allowed to submit the written uh, questions, we call them QFRs, questions for the record. Uh, through the close of business on Thursday, March 23rd, and we'll compile those uh, questions and send them to our witnesses, to all of you, and uh, we'll ask that you reply by th uh, Thursday, April the 6th. And, um, last thing I, I, I want to say, uh, my mother was a deeply religious woman. She would drag my sister and me to church every in West Virginia, yeah, where we were born, and we drag us to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, and every Thursday night. And she wanted to make sure that we understood the difference between right and wrong. We embraced Matthew 24, the least of these. When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked, and on and on, on. But she was she was really big on the, the golden rule. And she liked to say, she never used the word def default, like uh, when, when you're not sure what to do, default to the golden rule. But uh, uh, that's what I do. And uh, it can never go wrong. It can never go wrong. And in a situation like this, we've got to just put ourselves in the shoes of the people in, uh, in East Palestine and other places around the, the, the country, when they are similarly scared, have their lives changed, their, you know, their livelihoods uh, d diminished, the value of their homes diminished. We just got to put ourselves in, in, the, in the shoes of those people and, can, and do it over and over and over again. And if we do that, at the end of the day, we'll have done our jobs and actually done the right thing, which we've talked about here quite, uh, quite a bit. 
And uh, the last thing, I, I used the word a bit earlier, empower. Empower. I, 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 one of the things I, I, I say a whole lot is if you give a person a, a fish, you feed them for a day. If you teach a person to fish, uh, they can feed themselves for a lifetime. I always thought that was in the Bible. I've quoted it a million times and did it about a year ago, and I was uh, given a speech. And after it was over, a preacher came up to me and he said, Senator, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> well, I said, well, it should be. <laughs> well, it ought to be. Um, the, uh, there's, uh, and in addition to making sure people have a place to live and we clean up the water and everything, the idea of empowering people to help themselves. And that people, that's what people want. They want to be empowered. And there's a lot of ways. We all have a hand in, in doing that. And, uh, and I pledge that that's going to be part of our focus on, uh, on this com committee going, going forward. And uh, again, uh, to a guy who used to ride the train a lot, Albert Einstein used to ride the train a lot on Northeast Corridor a uh, hundred years ago. And again, he did say uh, uh, more than a few times, the adversity lies opportunity. Lots mm -hmm. of adversity here. Lots of uh, adversity here. But we're not out uh, no, without opportunity as well. And I think with your help and the folks that you represent, we're going to come close uh, to realizing that opportunity. And if we do, the people in uh, these communities that have been more than just disadvantaged, but, uh, uh, really subjected to a, a terrible uh, episode in their lives. But at the end of the day, I, I hope they'll say, well, uh, they, uh, they must have read the, the, the golden rule somewhere because they've uh, come through for us. With that, uh, I, uh, I think I've, um, I think I already mentioned uh, the, uh, the, the questions for the records, I think. So with that, uh, it's a wrap. We're done. Thank you very much. More to be, a lot more to be done. A lot more to be done. But thank you for the, your participation today.